ladies and gentlemen, it is Sunday, January 28th, 2024, which is 16 years and about a week and a half after the disappearance of Tommy Booth, which you'll be able to learn about on our uh, Friday video this week. So just giving you a little teaser there to let you know. But today, despite the fact that on Friday we did a video about a missing National Park Ranger, which is something we've talked about just over and over and over and over again, we had the opportunity to sit down with Benjamin Olshin here, who is a a professor, a world traveler, a master mason, just a whole bunch of different cool stuff. And we wanted to talk today about uh, simulation theory. We had you on a little bit ago, uh, about about almost a year ago at this point, I think. And we talked about lost civilizations, Atlantis, all of those concepts. So uh, we got back in touch and I was like, all right, let's what's something else we can talk about? Because you were actually one of uh, you, you were a fan favorite guest on the show. Um, so I was I was very excited to have you back. But you want to give everybody an idea of, of who you are? Sure, absolutely. In fact, I was at a talk the other day and it was by a pretty famous uh, professor locally. And the woman who introduced him said, and now for a man who needs no introduction, whereas I need an extensive introduction because <laughs> my career is so strange. So I'm actually from the Philadelphia area, and I like to tell people I'm just a regular Philadelphia guy. Uh, but as the host said, I ended up through a series of circumstances living all over the world. Um, mainly, I wanted to work and do research overseas. So I lived in England, I lived in Portugal, I lived in Brazil, I lived in Japan, I lived in Taiwan. I uh, did my graduate work in Canada. <clears throat> and since then, I've also been many places, again, Indonesia, Turkey, West Africa, and it's because I'm interested in a big variety of topics. So also for the audience, you should know that I, I try to view myself as not the typical academic. I was a college professor for many years. I'm semi-retired now, uh, but I'm atypical in the sense that I like all kinds of stuff. I'm interested in straight history. I'm interested in physics and philosophy, and I'll be talking about that tonight. Because I lived in Asia for a long time, I got really interested in Taoism and Buddhism, and I've actually taught courses in that. So I, I kind of do what I like and research what I like and talk about what I like. And now sort of later in life, um, because I met our host not that long ago, I guess about a year ago, I got really interested in the sort of venue of podcasts and things like this, sort of speaking to audiences outside academia, because one of the things I found many years ago is that there are lots and lots of people interested in topics ranging from the interesting to the weird who are outside academic circles. And that's great because I think mm -hmm. knowledge is something that should be for the people. And I know that's part of a, a the, the focus of this show, kind of the yeah. goal of this show. Take, so, take the academic and, and put it right in front of the average person instead of keeping it locked away in an ivory tower. <laughs> right. And that, that's an issue that's come up repeatedly in the show and not to get off topic. But, you know, one of the reasons that this show talked about Graham Hancock is he kind of represents people trying to do that. Now, he's a journalist by profession, and I respect that. But on the other hand, I think the way he does it and the message that he's sending out is not the right one. There's sort of like as we say in Taoism, there's a middle path or in Buddhism, there's a middle path uh, where we can talk about things in a popular way in an exciting way but while still retaining some kind of integrity and today the topic is i guess this just came up through a random discussion today the topic is going to be about virtual realities and simulation but also i hope towards the end of the program by extension this idea of living in a dream world and how we might figure out what is the nature of this dream or illusion if it is one so we're going to go i hope mm -hmm from sort of the scientific, physics, philosophy, to the mystical and religious. And we'll see how they're all connected, because they're all connected. Um, as Aiden mentioned, I did write a book on this. This is not exactly a book promo, but I think you're going to post up the title yeah, of the book. Yeah, it is right in, the, uh, right in the description right now, if anyone wants to check it out. Do you want to give a title and a quick summary? Yeah, so uh, the book is entitled Deciphering Reality. Uh, design simulations and test and, and and the way I guess let me give a little bit, bit of background so I, I urge you to look at this book it's not an academic book it talks about everything from Taoism to physics to art and I'll talk a little bit about art um, and I got interested in this I'm sort of embarrassed to say but I got interested in it the way a lot of people did 
which was by seeing the matrix. <laughs> and I found when I was teaching, I was teaching a college class uh, Friday and I was amazed, like, I'm so old now that a lot of the students now have not seen The Matrix. That movie is is old. But you got to see the movie. That That's a mess. Right. It does hurt. It shows Really? How old yeah, yeah. Well, it's, the movie's 1999, right? Yeah. And um, oh. it's a great movie. And it was, you know, it was seminal. It really brought this issue mm -hmm. to the fore. And the, the brothers, who are now sisters, who made the movie... Um, they had read a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, Plato, talked about Plato's cave, all that stuff. So I watched that. And then the other one that people are more familiar with now is Inception, right? Yeah. The multiple layers of reality. And students have told me there's like horror movies, too, now that have this premise, too, of living in an illusion. So that's what got me interested in it. And it's sort of typical with me. And again, this is a great sort of thing for listeners to contemplate. I've always had this thing where I'll like find a topic like simulated realities, illusion, and then I'll read everything I can find. I think Aiden is like this too. He's sort of obsessive with this stuff. And then I'll find that I'm dissatisfied with this stuff. And I'll say, damn, you know, I want to write my own book. And so I did. I really wrote the book for myself. Um, and it was funny too. So I guess I can tell this story. This is cool. So my daughter was very little at the time and she had a stuffed toy like this. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to make it talk, you know, like you do with kids. And it's like, hi, hi, Astrid. And then one day she asked me, she's sitting on the sofa. She goes, is he real? And I was like, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, are you just moving his arms or does he do that by himself? And mm -hmm. I was like, uh oh, like, what do you tell a child? This? <laughs> so that really pushed me to sort of write my own book. Because when you write a book, you know, it's not about your own pretentiousness. In an ideal world, it's about you having a chance to struggle with some difficult mm -hmm. material. Like you guys do it through the show, Aiden yeah. and Aiden, right? You do it through the show. It's like, we're going to take the boy in the box. I can't get that out of my head. <laughs> it's like, and we're going to like, look at it this way and look at it this way and think about this and think about this and stuff like that. And um, th that's what I do, you know, through writing and now through this. So that's how I ended up writing the book was I felt driven by this question personally like what is this reality we're living in um and there's another backstory too which i can tell but you guys i don't want to sure monopolize this so yeah no of course i mean I, I think probably probably the place i'd want to start things off is you know how how do you define uh existence okay fair enough so existence i i said this to somebody the other day and it scared the hell out of them existence should scare you okay because existence is this you you're born into the world mm -hmm. and i don't think either of you have seen a baby being born but not it's yet really not yet right. not quite yet <laughs> not quite yet so the baby comes out and one of the scariest things is particularly like my child was born at i think like two in the morning so it's completely dark outside and you take them home and all of a sudden you're holding them and light is coming through the window and you turn them to the light and you realize like oh my god you realize oh my god this is their first experience seeing the sun so it's this whole plato's cave thing which i'll, I'll talk about so existence is this two-phase process suddenly you come into being right there mm -hmm. you are i mean it's so weird i'll tell you you live in a house you have a spare room and suddenly there's there's a soul in that room mm -hmm. It needs diapers and milk and stuff. No, people don't usually talk about it this way, but you should. But the second thing, which you guys will be familiar with, is that you're eating, you're going to the bathroom, you're doing all that stuff, right? You're you're this tiny infant or toddler. And then one day when you're about two and a half, maybe three years old, for Aiden, it was probably one year old, you suddenly look at your hands, look at yourself, look at the mirror, and you go, Oh my God, I exist. There's mm -hmm. a me and there's a you, subject object dichotomy. And that's existence. So, existence is this awareness of self, other, mm -hmm. and then all the rest of the life is all the existential tension in that thing. Like, why am I here? Why at this time? What is this around me? What is this external world? What is this body, et cetera? Right. So, you know, this has been written about by philosophers and other people for thousands of years but that's how i define existence it's that kind of presence that's very sudden inexplicable mm -hmm. and and it's immersive 
you know, that's an important thing for this discussion. It's immersive. You are in that thing. So you have no kind of objective detached standpoint to do any real analysis. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like feeling around like this. And that that's one of the things that I really get into in the book. And I'm really puzzled by, because this is like, a problem on top of not only you have to solve a puzzle but you're inside the puzzle it's like those escape rooms that people are really into yeah this is the ultimate escape room mm -hmm. here you are so Isn't would you it? essentially say that you know by your definition it seems you're kind of saying that consciousness and existence are kind of interchangeable terms in that way yeah and the reason you know in consciousness you guys could have a whole other program on mm -hmm. consciousness <laughs> For the sake of this, consciousness is important because the, the consciousness functions as this awareness of, of self and other. If mm -hmm. you weren't conscious, you'd have no problem. And right. essentially, when you're, you're a tiny infant, you're not conscious in that same way. You know, we, this gets into the Taoist aspect. For animals, most animals, we think, are not conscious in that way. They are aware of hunger. They go eat. They're aware of danger. They fly away, mm -hmm. right? Things like that. But our consciousness makes us uh, aware of this sort of existential crisis. It causes this angst, it's this realization. So for the sake of this argument, consciousness for now, we can stick with it just as that. Yeah, I think I, I like that. That is a just series of, I like the way you segmented that is I think how I yeah, wanted yeah, to yeah. respond. Um, Essentially one is like awareness of like, Ex like your surroundings mm -hmm. and then the other is awareness of your existence yeah. as a whole like right. being alive yeah so it's, yeah being alive yeah and, and that's, i think that's, therefore i am yeah yeah i think therefore i am and and then the process so you no know, descartes says i think therefore i am and then the whole process is then i think what i am how i am why mm -hmm. i am and it just concatenates you know and trust me the older you get you know the more you feel this sort of tension and, and so let me interject just at this point for for clarification sure. As, as we get into this topic more deeply, you know, we got to talk about Plato's allegory, the cave. And I don't mm -hmm. know if you've done this in another program, but just for people that don't haven't heard of this, and this was really the basis of the Matrix movie. So Plato, around 2,400 years ago, it's really remarkable, uh, wrote up this allegory. And he uses it for politics. And I don't want to sound too much like a, a professor and stuff like that, but he, everyone should know this. So Plato describes like this hypothetical world where people are chained in a cave looking at the cave wall with the shadows on it right like a tv screen and he makes this point that their whole existence has been like this only seeing shadows and why is that important well because it's like it's our existence right you're born into this one world this is what you perceive it's all the senses and the prisoners in the cave are, are totally cool with this because for them, reality is what is consistent. And every day they see the shadows, every day they hear the, the noises, you know, as the shadows mm -hmm. move and interact, horses and figures, etc. And then Plato describes this whole process where a prisoner then is freed, stands up, the body hurts. Remember in the Matrix, Neo's body like really hurts when he's finally freed from the pod. And the prisoner turns around and suddenly sees that all the images that he saw were actually just shadows of objects being held. And then he sees, moreover, that people were manipulating those objects. So the prisoner sees that his reality was not only fake, it was mediated, controlled by somebody else. And then even that is not the reality because then he's led out of the cave where he sees the sun, our sun. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my God, I, the, the light, the light, right? And looking at a three-dimensional object, like a physical object is really, really hard for him because it's completely inconsistent with his formerly totally consistent reality. And the cave allegory kind of goes on from there uh, in a couple of ways. First of all, the fact that when this freed prisoner is sent back to free the others, they don't want to leave, right? Because their reality is comfortable. It's what they know, et cetera. So there's a whole allegory behind that. But then more importantly is once you are out in the sun, like you guys are, we're in this world, Plato's whole point is hint, hint, you're still in a cave. There's a whole nother layer to go up in. It's level upon level upon level upon level. And that's something 
you know, we'll return to when we talk about the Gnostics, because it's not only this idea that we're in an illusion, digital simulates something, it's that it's an illusion within an illusion within an illusion, like in, um, what's the other movie? Uh, we were Inception. Talking about what's Inception, where it's a dream within a dream within a dream. And so this idea is, you no, know, it's a very deep idea, a very old idea, and it kind of lays this foundation for what we're going to talk about. But also, you know, you asked about existence and consciousness. This is the nature of, of, of humans in that we're conscious enough to be aware of an existence and at the same time say, well, there must be something beyond this existence. It's What do they call that? Like the itch that cannot be scratched, mm -hmm. right? It's just terrifying. And you read about this in Taoism, in Buddhism, you know, even in, in Gnostic Christianity. So that's a kind of good groundwork to know, like, where are we at and what are our tools? Well, our tools is just, yeah, consciousness, the mind. And then we have to sort of go from there. And how do we go from there? We'll mm -hmm. talk about that. So it seems to it seems that you you tie in your your definition, your understanding of existence with perception of reality. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and yeah, what is our perception of reality? Well, the senses, right? Mm -hmm. But the senses are really limited because you know, in Plato's cave, the senses can be placated with shadows and images. You know, I can be told, yes, this is lemonade. And what did you guys, you guys ate burritos. Like, mm -hmm. yes, that's a burrito. Oh, and your stomach feels full now, mm -hmm. et cetera. So going back to Plato, you mentioned Descartes. You know, even pre-technology, pre-sophisticated technology, yeah. people were very familiar with this idea that all of this could be faked, right? Could be, you know, created as an illusion, the illusion of feeling full, the illusion of seeing something in front of you, uh, the illusion of, of touching something, mm -hmm. et cetera. And that's very important, this kind of realization that the sense, how does Plato put it? The senses are unreliable. Yeah, They're it's a... I remember in college, I took a class on medieval philosophy, and we read a lot of Aquinas and Ibn Sina. And that yeah. was that was one of those recurring themes was like, what, what is the function and form of the soul, which I think was right. kind of their, their way of asking the same sort of question, like what, what makes us us, rather right. than just, you know, animals or meat sacks walking around. I mean, obviously, they didn't understand the concept of electrical activity in the brain but they were trying to figure out why is it that we are what what makes us us well um, and the soul has a very special role in this because so this is the one of the questions we're wrestling with right so how the hell do we get out of this simulation how how do we realize that hmm. this is not right so the soul for plato is the key because something in your soul particularly people like you guys right or people listen to the show their soul is kind of itching, right? Mm -hmm. Because Plato's idea is that the soul is the one entity that knows that the sensory world is not where it's at, mm -hmm. that th this world is an illusion. If you didn't have a soul, like you say, you're just a, like a, a bunch of meat, a machine functioning, it wouldn't matter. But for Plato, it's the soul that kind of makes us ask this question. Mm -hmm. And for him, it's the soul that eventually makes us sort of look down and say, wait, what are these chains? What is mm -hmm. this? Why am I here? A and that's sort of what triggers this investigation to go beyond the simulation, beyond the illusion, et cetera. Right. So the soul, you, you find that in Plato, you find that in Buddhism, you find a version of that in Taoism, because you need something, right, to make you uh, feel, the term I always use is feel that dissonance. Right. That something is not quite right about this. It is some dreamlike quality that is is not consistent. In fact, in so when we say when we say simulation, uh, you know, a lot of people when they say simulation theory, they they're kind of looking at the idea that this is all a, a computer simulation in some higher realm of existence. That there is right. some teenager sitting at his computer and playing us like The Sims. Um, yeah. is that is that where you're coming at it from? Or is it so, more of a metaphysical sort of like, you know, how we perceive reality is not necessarily all of the layers. So it's all of the above. So when I started doing this, um, I started it uh, looking from a physics viewpoint. So what's interesting is there had been all this philosophical stuff, like you say, in the Middle Ages and stuff with Descartes and before that Plato. 
So there's a, a very famous uh, philosopher named Hillary Putnam, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating. Talk about Philly. He went to Central High School. For those of you who are from Philly, oh, no way. I didn't realize this. Yeah, and so in the 1980s, again, this is very early on in terms of computers. In the 1980s, Hillary Putnam writes this famous thing called Brain in a Vat. You can mm -hmm. look it up. And he sets up this scenario where um, late at night, Aiden Mattis is asleep. An evil scientist comes in, removes your brain, puts it in a vat with liquid so it survives, but plugs wires into it that feed it visual input, uh, tactile input, olfactory input, mm -hmm. et cetera. So when Aiden wakes up, he looks out his window, he goes downstairs, he eats breakfast, he continues his existence, except that it's entirely simulated. Mm -hmm. So Putnam, this philosopher, he says, how could Aiden ever know that this transition had happened? How could he prove that he was in a simulated reality rather than that direct physical interactive reality he had? So Putnam is the one who, in a certain regard, first introduces this idea into sort of computation, even though he's doing it as a, as a philosopher. But then more to your point, oddly enough, dating back even earlier to the 1940s, there was a, a German named Konrad Zuse who hypothesized that you could have a digital reality. This is like really early in the 1940s, where again, everything that we consider sort of tangible and, and, and tactile and visual inputs could all be a simulation. And then certainly you guys, your generation in particular, starting with video games and increasingly sophisticated video games or virtual reality, it came to be understood that the ability to do this is, is quite real, right? It's quite um, possible. Do you understand what I'm saying? That mm -hmm. as the technology became more sophisticated, people said, okay, I like the philosophical stuff, but now we know that somebody could actually, like you said, some kid could construct all this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that, and that's a, a route that we should talk about. So, yeah, there's absolutely that very hard physical digital component to this, mm -hmm. you know, a, a simulation. Right. So, the, you know, I, I guess an important question to ask then is if if we are bonds in somebody else's game, why? Why, why create us? Why put us here? Um, which is a question so, that religion has been trying to answer for thousands and thousands of years. And that's why it's so odd. So we're going to talk about a, a digital thing. And then, yeah, we'll talk about the Gnostics. Mm -hmm. So it, it astonishes me how much the scientific and the technological really parallel the religious question, because they're all sort of these attempts to grasp for, how did you put it, like motive, meaning, you know, all this stuff. So why would somebody do this? So there's a, a guy, again, which everybody should read, Nick Bostrom, B-O-S-T-R-O-M, Nick Bostrom. I think he's British. He's a philosopher and he's important for a couple of reasons. So he wrote uh, not that long ago, this idea that this simulation that we're living in right now was probably created in the distant future. And so that the real year out there is whatever, you know, 10,000 mm -hmm. AD. Um, and that this was created again, to your question, for what motivation? Well, Think about how cool it would be to create a historical simulation on, on your computer, like a Sims game. So let's say you create one where it's the ancient Romans against the barbarians and you populate it with little mm -hmm. characters and you set them at each other. That would be great, right? It'd be so fun and you give them the illusion of choice, et cetera. So what Nick Bostrom does, he looks at it purely from statistics. He says, if we're so good at technology, chances are, somebody will have developed this, mm -hmm. will have done it because they're motivated just like us. They want to have fun. They want to create interesting historical simulations. So he argues, chances are it's already been done and we're living in it. Mm -hmm. And so this is why I mentioned before the show, of all people to be interested in this stuff is Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. So the story is that he was at a board meeting I think it was with Bloomberg, though, that the Bloomberg was in the room. And he just he gets up and says, I think this world is a simulation. I read this Nick Bostrom thing. And actually, just as an aside, my publisher in the Netherlands <laughs> emails me, says, we got to send a copy of the book to Elon Musk. And I was mm -hmm. like, definitely. You're like, please, please do. <laughs> please. 
Never heard from him. We sent the book. It was mailed. Right. But yeah, so this is a very intriguing idea for people like him because it's this very technologically sophisticated idea. And again, you guys would know, like, why would you do this? Well, for fun. There's another great movie called 13th Floor. And it's the same idea as simulation. And there, the, frankly, the, the evil scientist creates the simulation so he can sort of uh, download his consciousness in, right? Mm -hmm. He lies and fool around, go to bars, meet girls. It's purely hedonist. So there are any number of reasons why someone would create a simulation like mm -hmm. this technologically. The religious ones we'll talk about right. subsequently. But yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. People are people, right? It's a little unsettling to think about, though. Like totally unsettling. <laughs> I mean, because yeah. I, I, on the one hand, it's like if if you think about it, and obviously, in my opinion, come coming from you know a religious background, I I find the idea of just being a a digital character in somebody else's complex video game, you know, rather unfulfilling as compared to there being yeah. some sort of like like with Christianity, the idea that we were created as companions. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, I, I would like to believe that there is a reason I exist beyond some kid wanted to play, you know, hmm, what what happens if we go back to 1995 and instead of having, I, I don't know, you know, who's who's a good option, to, who's somebody to pick here, instead of having Jeb Bush win the 2016 primary, let's have Donald Trump do it and see what happens. Like, I, I don't I don't like that idea. Well, but I understand where where the possibility fits in and and how the how the concept works. Well, but personally, being a little bit more removed from the religious aspect of it, just based on my upbringing, it's interesting for for me to just kind of explore all the possible options because, like, the idea that we are essentially living because, like, as you were describing that, I was thinking of it less as like an individual simulation, but more in like, you know, the formation of what we would call the physical mm -hmm. Earth is essentially yeah. a playground. For which maybe instead of one teenager in a kid in a room, maybe we are existing on the plane of a giant, you know, multiplayer game in which, terrifying. in which the gods are just different players and they have created different factions to try and win. And it seems like currently, you know, <clears throat> whoever's uh, username is Yahweh is winning. <laughs> By, to, by just numbers <laughs> yeah. uh but just the idea that you know they're all like at a, at a big land party and the guy who is username is zeus is like guys just let me respawn characters please yeah. <laughs> i well, hate well, the I mean, idea of there being just some sort of giant like land tournament and <laughs> and you know gamer tag yahweh is like you know how i can really win this I'm gonna split my religion into three religions exactly. and have and have them all fight each other exactly. in different directions yeah. like you know <laughs> But see, that's the thing. I mean, what you've just described is sort of the, the crisis of humans. Uh, yeah, like we should talk about religion then. So it's, you know, this is part of it. That you are faced with this existence where you think that maybe there are multiple gods and they're totally random, like in the Greco-Roman, mm -hmm. you know, pagan pantheon, where the gods are just like human gamers, really, right, with different whims. Yeah, there's no no question about that. That That's sort of uh, what you wake up thinking and it's uncomfortable right mm -hmm. all right so you guys probably know this but but let's think about it's in i always tell people like you should realize like the weirdest idea you can imagine somebody's come up with it and investigated it, and that's good so what really got me hooked in this and I, I guess only started reading this not that long ago either was about the gnostics mm -hmm. So, you know, and Gnosis means knowledge. So the Gnostics are like seekers of knowledge. What does that mean? And so you mentioned like you know, the big three religions. Well, let's say there are many religions, but let's say particularly Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. What a lot of people don't know is all three of those religions have a heretical subset of Gnostics, right? And so the Gnostic members are people who within those religions say, Oh, yes, God is all loving and all great. We should follow God. And this is the earth he created or whatever. But the Gnostics say, OK, yeah, that may be. But just like you guys are saying, why are things so messed up? And like, why is there so much conflict? And why do we die? And why do good people suffer? Right. You're with me, et cetera. Right. So the mm -hmm. Gnostics developed a couple of weird ideas. One was that. In some versions, this world is not the world created by God. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's created by a demigod, a demiurge, it's yeah. called, a lesser god, right? You know this. 
And so there's a higher God outside there. Mm -hmm. We're separated from them. And this yeah, separation- Which created the Demiurge and the Demiurge created then the created Demiurge. us. Exactly. So and the Demiurge are, isn't like a, it's not the sentient God we that, that we think about. It's more of a just general universal will. Right. It's like a universal. Yeah. It's because Urgos in ancient Greek means just a will. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the perfect word for it. Right. So just this so is that like that under the logos kind of thing or is that. No. So so logos is the much higher logos is like the reason. So that's the really mm -hmm. perfect God operates towards logos. We're not living in a world anything like that. That's why things make no friggin sense whatsoever, because we are two steps removed, at least from the logos. Right. The divine, the will. I, I, that's. And so people like you, clever people, realize like, man, something is messed up because this does not seem like a God created world. And it's because it's not. It's created by this this will, right? This urge. And so it's very strange. But then the Gnostics who do know about the logos, the Gnostics say, well, wait a minute, we do have knowledge right here. We are the three of us talking. Mm -hmm. We've got audience members who have ideas together we can figure this out and we can reason our way out mm -hmm. or find some glimpses of divine knowledge that have like percolated down into this plane and decode our way out into the higher realm, which is weirdly analogous with what's happening in certain realms of philosophy of physics, which is that the properties of uh, particles uh, certain physical laws like gravitation, electromagnetism, and quantum mechanics are these little clues of the code in which all this is written. And if we mm -hmm. just cognitively, like intellectually, solve that code, then we can, that's why I call the book Deciphering Reality, we can decipher this. And it's weird because the Kabbalah, that's all that's about. It's about Looking at God, like you talked about mm -hmm. uh, other aid and you talked about like the physical earth. So the whole Kabbalistic project is to look at physical creation and find what's called the, the macrocosm in microcosm. Mm -hmm. You know, human beings, the hands, the structures, the cells, the Fibonacci series and flowers, all those are like clues, clues, mm -hmm. clues that we can use as our project to decode and this, by the way, is the Freemasonic mm -hmm. project as well, right? For another episode. <laughs> um, this idea that we're going to sort of think our way out of the box. Mm -hmm. And and it's so weird and messed up in so many ways. But yeah, that's a big part of this. Exactly. Yeah. This, because that disgruntlement, you know, that Aiden Mattis feels with the world, people have felt for thousands of years. And you should feel it. If you don't feel it, there's something wrong mm -hmm. with you. Well, right? I think it, yeah. that's also interesting to me because like the idea that you know, whether or not if from a religious perspective or even an atheistic perspective, we all to some level feel this need for purpose in our lives. Yeah. And, you know, it's clear that, you know, for one reason or another, whether you're coming from the atheistic perspective of, oh, this was, you know, an evolutionary byproduct that allowed us to formulate societies that would allow us to better succeed over other, you know, species because we could better organize ourselves by giving you know, each other and ourselves tasks for us to hyper focus on and things like that. Or it's from a religious perspective, uh, you could probably speak better to the origins of that and the, you know, the details of that from a religious perspective. But I think it's interesting that if we're looking at it from a simulation perspective, mm -hmm. you know, where, where does that purpose originate from? Where does that lead us to? And then, you know, kind of the idea of like, is that ending at all correlated to us being able to essentially transcend from the simulation mm -hmm. or is that right. even a possibility yeah. there's a couple right. things i wanted to just address really quick because i know that what you just said is going to get called out in the comments the and that's the freemasonic <laughs> idea too that that freemasonry as a a concept is is seeking to understand the structure of a created universe um yeah but it's not necessarily like you not all Freemasons are into the Kabbalah. Not all like, there's there's different tiers and levels and oh, interest yeah. groups. So I just want to make sure that nobody looks at it and goes, "See, see, they're Satanists." <laughs> but, but it's not. And in fact, I was going to say the opposite. That this is, in fact, here's a, a nice way to lay this out very clearly. I, I think I can safely say that most of the major religions of the world are mm -hmm. interested in the project that 
other Aiden just talked yeah. about, right? Th that it's this project to find uh, the true meaning of our existence, to look at the transcendent, you know, what's beyond this. And what's interesting is that most of them will, will say that the way to do that is through this process of faith. So you believe that there is an ultimate God who's benevolent and that the universe therefore is benevolent and that the way to transcendent knowledge is through this kind of revelation revelatory process so if you believe it will be revealed you guys are with me on this right yeah freemasonry you know uh is really just uh i mean it's it's a, a philosophy that still is connected to religion you cannot be a freemason and an atheist Freemasonry, the only additional element, which is not weird, mysterious, or conspiratorial at all, is because it was formulated in the Enlightenment, believes uh, that reason plays a big mm -hmm. part of this, that, that God is reasonable, it works according to the logos, right, the divine pattern. And so distinguished men talking together in a brotherhood can come to understand this. But that's no different from Christian theologians mm -hmm. working their way through or Jewish rabbis interpreting the law. I want to point out that one of the interesting things is that Buddhism also kind of believes in many respects in certain forms of Buddhism that the everyday world we live in, the kind of operative universe, I call it, is illusory, right? It's called Maya, right? It's the illusion um, that your project as a Buddhist, though, is not to sort of part the veil. It's simply to conduct yourself in this realm to the best of your ability. And that, that's a very interesting thing that in Buddhism, there's not this project of seeking the transcendent and even certain forms of Christianity, the project is just to kind of do your best on earth and then the other stuff will be revealed in time. But again, in religion, I always talk about tension. Now, in religion, there's always this tension between everybody knows we're in this kind of mm -hmm. earthbound operative environment and we should try to do good. But at the same time, people are dissatisfied. That's our nature. You know, we don't like being so, you know, being down low. So we like looking up. And so there's always this sort of Gnostic heretical sex. In Buddhism, it's interesting that one of the primary symbols of Buddhism is the lotus flower because the lotus grows out of the muddiest, crappiest water, and yet comes up all pure and clean. So mm. it's this idea that our project is to try to come up and be pure, clean, compassion, good as possible, fully realizing that we're immersed, we're rooted in this crap. But then where it leads from there is not important. For people like me, just for sake of full disclosure, I've always been a transcendentalist. I'm like, mm -hmm. I want to know what's beyond the veil, right. da, da, da. And it pretty much leads to a life of frustration. You know, <laughs> that's well, that's why we're having this show. So. Yeah. So I, I mean, I've, I, I have found the entire concept of simulation theory very intriguing. Come as a creationist, as an as an observer, somebody who believes that the the universe was created by intelligent design. To be clear, I'm not a young Earth creationist. I don't believe the Earth was created six thousand years ago. Um, I think that uh, I am a Christian. I do believe that the earth was created in a way that fits the biblical narrative. But when I read Genesis, I don't go, okay, God, you know, set up the, the, the alarm clock for 24 hours and then did everything. And then that day was over and then he rewound the clock. I think I read that as, you know, okay, well, the first day is an epic of creation. And then there's another one and then another one. And, that, yeah, and these right. could be thousands of years. These could be billions of years. It's a segmentation of time. Um, and what what I find most interesting about simulation theory is you look at all sorts of all sorts of religions. Not all of them even have a creation story. Correct. Simulation yeah. theory is basically the creation story without any of the religion. <laughs> so it's That's you know, this correct. is the universe was created. Go right. ahead and do things. Like there's no it's, there's no objective morality. It's entirely your interpretation. Right. And that's why in, in the book, it's funny, I started it with physics and I looked at physics of simulations. And I can talk about that depending on the time. But I also did a huge chunk of looking at it through a religious perspective, particularly Taoism. But Christianity would do just as well. And so it's funny. So I'll, let's go with the Christianity since you brought it up. And this is one just as an aside, I'm not teaching tonight. And this is not a <laughs> class. But I like referring to teaching because it's a good sort of laboratory for how these ideas work. 
So it's so funny. I always tell people to teach nowadays because most younger people are are not religious at all. Yeah. So you're you're one of the exceptions. Most of my students are not religious. But what I tell students is that even in Christianity, which many of them reject, mm-hmm. right? I say you have this exact narrative, not only as you said, of the created world, but then the narrative of Jesus is really the narrative of this figure who's coming down trying to you know, appeal to people's consciousness of this dissonance. Mm -hmm. Jesus addresses this directly. In the Matrix, the Morpheus character and the Neo character are both Christ-like characters, right? Where one is like John the Baptist and others Jesus. Mm -hmm. So there's no question about that in the movie. It's explicit. But what do I mean by that? Well, in the Christian narrative, one of the satisfying things about that is that Jesus is this figure who is human, right? He's this guy with a beard who's a carpenter, mm-hmm. who, who is among the people with people. He, he's killed in the end, right? Mm-hmm. So the whole point of that is showing he's mortal, he's mortal, but he's also this totally transcendent figure. Right. So in the early Christian church, you know, this whole tension about the father and the son, whatever. It's like a friend of mine who's a minister says, all that is unimportant because what the narrative is really saying is that there's this sort of distension between the transcendent realm and the mortal realm. And so Christianity does a really nice job of saying, yes, there's tension, yes, there's separation, but here's this figure who is gonna connect the two. Mm -hmm. And he will speak in parable, in metaphor, performs a few miracles, just to, to grab a few more people. The idea being that the reason he does that is if we believe that there is this transcendent realm and we're just in this mm-hmm. simulation, there's no way you or I or this other guy, we're going to understand that because we're like mortals with what mm-hmm. a 90 year lifespan. And we're mainly worried about eating our burritos and pizza and having a beer after the show. Right. So the whole idea of the Christian narrative is great. It's saying that I'm going to explain to you mm-hmm. regular folks, something so mind blowing. And the only way I can do that is through extended metaphor, like weird metaphor, and then to sacrifice my life Mm -hmm. just to show you this. And it's very heavy duty. I'm not Christian. I went to Christian schools. We can see by the logo here, right? Like Aiden. Um, But this was one of the great things that I was taught, you know, that this is a really tight narrative, really, you know, thorough narrative Mm -hmm. for addressing this. Whether you believe in it or not is immaterial. It's just a really, really good narrative for tackling this because that's what we're doing right we're tackling this conundrum of existence so yeah more power to you this is a very good way to approach it i I also i I mean with the as you're sitting there talking about it it's it's really it's occurring to me and i've thought about it in the past but the structure of a simulated existence fits within the christian and jewish framework of how existence operates that there is our realm and then there's these spiritual realms outside of it that you know if you if you read through genesis and and this is you know there's a there there's a definitely a discussion within christianity a debate but you know of of what's going on who who Mm -hmm. is involved in the creation of of our existence because you have god who says you know let, let us make man in our image and there's a lot of people who have said, oh, well, it's that that word Elohim can be used in the singular. Um, right. And then you you go back and you read through it and you go, ah, I, I don't like that explanation at all. Um, so then you have, you know, another another interpretation of it is that, well, God, the most high Adonai Yahweh, this this figure is the creator being. But he has below him and between him and us a series of other beings that he created in some form or another. Those oh, yeah. are the, bena- the the Elohim. And then Elohim, we have the yeah. Benai Elohim, who are the, yeah. the sons of God in Genesis 1, um, or sorry, in Genesis 6. Uh, and so you've got this th- these layers, and there's also interpretations that suggest that, oh, well, after you know, there, there came a time in human history where God divided the nations up amongst mm-hmm. the, the Elohim. Right. And put one in charge of each of the the first nations of men, and that you have that when you think about what that sounds like, it sounds like somebody who created a game, took seventy oh, yeah. people, 
it's like a giant game of civilization if you've ever yeah. if you've ever heard of the game civilization sure. it's like a giant game of that and we're when we sit down to play a game of civ we're the elohim and sid yeah. Myers is is god because he created the whole thing <laughs> Um, obviously that probably sounds pretty blasphemous to a lot of people. Well, would that just, just to correlate that with, with history, would the Elohim in that regard essentially be the gods and demigods of like the Roman pantheon yeah, and the so there's, pantheon and things like that? Yeah. So there's, there's also interpretations then that, you know, Zeus is, you know, Semiaza, that's that kind of thing. Yeah. That there's yeah, these like, biblical terrible. figures, yeah. these angels that appear in in the Bible and in Enoch and the Apocryphal, the Deuterocanonical, all of the intertestamental period works where it's like, okay, so, you know, well, for example, even in the Bible, you have uh, Hamash, the, the god of the Moabites. He's referenced and he seems to have power and God doesn't say Hamash does not exist. He says he's powerless against me. Right. <laughs> like, so it's, you, you kind of, as you, you read through it and you look through some of the more esoteric aspects and some of the stuff that just doesn't get taught to you in Sunday school, you come across a much more complicated, spiritual, multi-dimensional yeah. world within Christianity. That well, that's I think, what the Gnostics oh, yeah. pick up on. So what happens, like, it's very interesting in the second century AD, so the second century CE, you have uh, certain writers, the Gnostics, who are picking up on this. They're like, yeah, this is much more complex. But that narrative eventually is pushed aside. I mean, you're not going to find Gnostics, you know, on the main line somewhere, no. et cetera. But it, that's an important tradition that existed historically mm -hmm. because, yeah, there seems to be these subsets and sub gods and, and hierarchies, et cetera. And all that is kind of excised. So in the spring, one of the, the courses that I'm teaching, uh, I was asked in this philosophy course to include some Christian writers. So I was like, I don't know, who should I include? So I asked this friend of mine, he said, include Irenaeus. So I was like, okay, and he's one of these early Christian fathers. And the most interesting thing about him is pretty late, you know, second century, he's writing these long diatribes against the Gnostics who are mm -hmm. still asking like the questions you're asking, like, hey, what happened to all these other characters? Mm -hmm. You know, what's going on? And it's amazing how completely that is defeated, is eliminated from the text. Um, and the textual tradition. Yeah, what did you say? You're not taught that in Sunday schools. Like, there's no way you're taught that in mm -hmm. Sunday school. Yeah, no. And, uh, you know, my daughter went to Catholic school and I said, you know, ask your teachers about this. And she goes, I don't think I should. But I think it's important, um, not mm -hmm. because like we're going to rebel against orthodoxy, but there's something in those mm -hmm. narratives uh, that means something. You know, it's, I don't know how to decipher it. You mentioned like the Book of Enoch. I mean, the Book of Enoch is is this whole sort of, parallel story about what this simulation is about mm -hmm. and how it functions and how the higher beings communicate with the lower beings it, it gets very very weird but wait can i interject something here yeah sure go for it all right so this is another weird idea that i encountered as i was writing the book and it's related to what you're talking about so it's very interesting when you started describing this you described uh, like higher and lower inner and outer right yeah. these hierarchies everything i read from like indigenous belief systems to Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, even science, all operates that way. So, right, look at physics. What does physics say? There's reality, which is made of matter, which is made of the fundamental mm -hmm. elements, the periodic table, which are made of atoms, which are made of subatomic particles down to the Higgs boson, quarks, quantum foam, right? Notice, da, da, da. Christianity, religious high and the low above below right and the layers in between mm -hmm. you guys are with me on this yeah. right so in one of these sleepless nights and when i was writing this book i had the weirdest dreams ever because <laughs> you're gonna sleep thinking about this stuff all of a sudden i i realized like that idea and i think it was also because i was teaching industrial design at the time that idea itself is totally arbitrary this idea that things have to be patterned like we humans pattern them above below inside outside right that's totally arbitrary it's what i call like prepositional thinking like imagine this like maybe if you've done a lot of drugs people can imagine this i haven't done that but think about this imagine where there is there are no prepositions there's not here there above mm -hmm. below inner outer because reality is so mysterious to us 
it might may not even be divided that way right that's so that then it gets really trippy so it's almost as if we get these narratives of the above the below mm -hmm. and even in in chinese philosophy you know which is more sophisticated in some ways it's you know Shangmian, Shangmian, above, below, Tian Shan, under heaven, and then uh, uh, connected to the earth. But imagine if all of that is just really simplified language for we stupid humans. Yeah. So imagine if there's no prepositions, even the idea that you are person located over there, we're in Phoenixville, right? And I'm here on the main line, that that's completely illusory. Mm -hmm. And, and so then we get into this really deep thing because then the nature of reality may not be about going up and, and finding what's up at the surface or going down and finding, finding the smallest and smallest particle. Like those directional approaches may be totally misguided. And then we're into really weird territory. Mm -hmm. well, right? yes. you, yeah. I was just going to say it's interesting because yeah. just from what I understand of psychology, I know there's been some research into kind of what you're saying about the the prepositional understanding of the universe from a human perspective in that like we organize our thought processes and our understanding of our environment from a tool-based perspective where it's like we right. we look at the utility of the objects around us right. and that's how we perceive right. it we perceive faces much faster and much more completely than other you know things in the environment around us and but we're limited by our physical abilities you know we can visually see the world around us but the amount of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see is only a small portion of what actually right. exists. You just did a Freemasonry. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the whole the like we perceive through tools. Yeah. Yeah, that's a huge, yeah. huge Freemasonic aspect. Is oh the, really? The idea yeah. of humans perceiving existence through that which we can manipulate with our hands and using the symbolism of that which we can manipulate with our hands to explain higher concepts. Interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, <laughs> well that's the thing. So <laughs> that's exactly the point. Well, it's funny because where I was going with that was essentially is like maybe the higher isn't necessarily higher in terms of those prepositional phrases, but more along that's the lines right. of higher in bandwidth of what we can perceive, kind of like yeah. what technology has allowed us. Like we can now see X-rays, gamma rays, infrared rays because of the tools that we have mm -hmm. developed in order to be able to do as such. Yeah, I also I, I did want to circle back really quick on one one aspect of the, the conversation we had just before this one, which was, uh, I think, one of the biggest issues with religion and specifically Abrahamic religion is the use of the term gods and God. Mm -hmm. I because it does not the English word God does not properly describe um, anything except the the creator being Yahweh, uh, or if you want to go with the, in the Islamic, it would be Allah, or the uh, with uh, with Hindu the the Brahmin, um, you know all of these the creative being, the one who is in charge of bringing all of this into existence. That is the only being in any religion that I think the term God in English should apply to, because the word God in English is inextricably tied now to the Christian deity. However, obviously the term applied to different types of beings beforehand. Um, you know, you have obviously the, the gods of the Norse pantheon, for example, they are not creative beings. There's a, right. a whole creative process that happens before Odin even comes into existence. Odin right. then slays a giant and crafts the earth from his bones, but the universe is not brought into existence by Odin. Just right. like the universe is not brought into existence by Vishnu or Shiva. I know, I think one of them is the one, it is like one of the chief deities. Um, I, I'm not as familiar with it. Um, but yeah, so, and if you look at uh, even Zoroastrianism, the, there's the, the god of good, the god of light and order and all that, and there's the god of darkness and chaos. Um, the god of darkness and chaos is capable of twisting things, much like Morgoth in Lord of the Rings, but he is not capable of creation. Only one is, and that's the chief deity. So I think that a big issue in terms of understanding uh, religious perspectives on existence and the classification of divine beings is the fact that we really only have one word to describe these things. We have said there's gods, and then, oh, well, if it's beneath a god, it's it's got to be part human, so it's a demigod. And then we have these this term spirits in the Bible. There's there's a lot of different terms for these things, and they're all very explicit. And instead, we just we say God and angels, and it's just not enough because there's God, 
And then there's these things that we call angels, which are extraordinarily varied and complicated um, and have, in some cases, free will. In some cases, they seem to be perfectly loyal. There's different roles and responsibilities amongst them. Um, so just in, I think, in terms of understanding the, the terminology of a conversation like this, it's important to, to recognize that we are limited by our vocabulary in this language. Well, um, and not just the vocabulary. It's the process itself. So you've opened up a whole nother can of worms here because <laughs> we have this idea of, uh, of an active creator, mm -hmm. right? In a lot of these religious things. And so one of the things in Judaism, and, and I guess in Islam to a certain extent too, to try to make this more accurate is they completely de-anthropomorphize the creator. Because remember in Judaism, God, first of all, is unmentionable. You cannot state the name, right? And God is just an emanation. Mm -hmm. You know, again, there's the Freemasonic thing, right? The the eye with the emanation mm -hmm. on the back of the dollar bill. So Jewish thinking is pretty sophisticated in this very early stage because it, it's saying, yes, there's a created thing. There's an entity maybe that creates it. You know, we let, use this label God, but the, the Jews say, but anything mm -hmm. that could create something like this would be unknowable, unmentionable, unviewable. It must just be no more mm -hmm. than an emanation. And when you look at uh, Kabbalah, mm -hmm. it's funny when they try to describe like viewing the creator, it's just done through these incredible metaphors, like the, the bright throne and approaching and the emanations mm -hmm. and the, the light, et cetera. So that's one point to think about. But again, everything that everything's sort of a trick. Mm -hmm. So you go from what you're talking about, which is, yeah, there's this issue of what we call God and it, is it really creator? And then there are these sub creators or sub beings. And then I say, OK, let's take it further. So there's an, a, an entity that's creative. But now we get to the more difficult thing is. You brought it up. It's this act of creation itself. OK, you know, the ancient Greeks dealt with this. If there's a creator. You know, it's all the typical philosophical questions. What came, but what created the creator, right? Did the creator create this in time or was time created with this, et cetera? Mm -hmm. And then what did the creator create this from? Were the materials existing and then the earth was formed and mm -hmm. the universe was formed out of these things? So when I was writing my book, this was one of the things that I wrestled with. And because I wasn't adhering to any particularly religious upbringing, I could sort of pick and choose. This was the problem that, particularly as I finished, you know, moved towards the end of the book, and I was like, I got to have an ending for this book. I got to submit it to the publisher. I was like, well, wait a minute. Now this is, it is Aiden's question. It's like, who created this? Why was it created? How was it created? And I have my own answer, which I can reveal during the show. But I think that's a very, very important uh, problem because you have, uh, by saying that there's a creative figure or entity that actually creates much more many more questions than it solves right and i think if you're going to deal with this and since our consciousness again allows us to formulate mm -hmm. these questions we got to tackle this too yeah. so we've introduced sort of yet another question into the creation simulation or not that we are resident mm -hmm. in you know yeah so i mean if you want to if you want to give that that answer that you have to the question we we did just hit 8 p.m so it's time to get move into the the q a session okay. so do you want to do you want to end the the discussion there before we move over to q a sure sure um so two things and again this is just food for thought no it's not me being narcissistic um in taoism everybody should read taoist texts they're easy to read they're fun i'm teaching Taoism in the semester i think i like it more than the students who cares in taoism there's a famous story that that lots of people know, people listening will know, it's the butterfly story. So in uh, a Taoist text called the Zhuangzi, there's this famous story where a guy dreams he's a butterfly, but then he thinks, well, maybe I'm the butterfly that is dreaming he's a guy, mm -hmm. right? So you don't know which is dreaming up which, mm -hmm. you know, is the butterfly dreaming up a man or is the man dream? Okay. And when I read that story, I thought, well, that's interesting because also Taoism never talks about a creator God. Mm -hmm. It talks about a sort of primal force, the Tao, that then creates yin and yang, which then differentiate in the, all the other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's what's called the uh, 
no, I forgot the one. So the 10,000 things, right? The material stuff of the universe, that's their creations. But it all goes back to that very strange story, right? Of which comes first, the dream or the dream or is the dream? Right? So I thought about that. I thought, okay, so how do we kind of modernize that or bring it into like a Christian realm or a realm of physics? And one of the ideas that kept sort of gnawing at the back of my head that you know other writers had kind of touched upon, there's this famous Argentine writer, Borges. If you don't know him, you know, you gotta read his stuff. And he kind of tackles this. And so think about it, like we are in this really weird existence. These, what did you call it? Like these meat, right? This meat that we inhabit, right? This flesh we are incarnated in. Uh, these strange conversations, the fact that the clock is ticking and we just got a few years left, uh, the fact that people do stupid things, the fact that uh, was you guys started the whole conversation with like, you know, different religions fighting each other, all this stuff. So you got to ask yourself, who in their right friggin' mind would come up with something like this, right? Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So when I was thinking about this question, being somewhat older and more cynical, I thought, the only person that could think up something this messed up is we ourselves. Hmm. And so that led me to think that the real conclusion to all this is that it is us dreaming ourselves into existence. And I thought, well, that's just a crazy idea. But then if you look at ancient Egyptian religions, their gods, how do their gods appear? The gods of the Egyptians mm -hmm. think themselves into existence. That's the narrative. Interesting. Like, that's really weird. So in Christianity, in Judaism, you have this default, here's God, here's the creator, creates the universe through an act of love, right? To have companionship, whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you look at these other religious traditions, Buddhism ignores it. Taoism talks about just a primal force, a sort of autonomous thing, which is sort of unsatisfactory. But that idea of beings thinking themselves into existence and what's the symbol of that? Again, you, you all know this. It's the Ouroboros, right? You know, the, the snake eating its tail. Mm -hmm. And I realized it's not the snake eating its tail. It's the snake sort of vomiting up itself. It's mm -hmm. creating itself as it goes round and round. And so I really began to think that the answer to this conundrum is we've thought this up ourselves. We've thought ourselves into existence because it's the only reason things would be so messed up, so weird. And also getting back to other Aiden's point, why this is sort of so unresolvable, like this mm. intensity of consciousness and this thing, like it, it, you know, when you sort of talk about it, you always end up going like this, right? This sort of circle. And so instead of getting away from that, why not accept, well, maybe it is a circle, right? And so that's, so I end the book that way. I mean, you can still read the book and, and see how I do it. That to me, it seemed the only way out of this conundrum is to think that we're the creator. We thought this up. We're mm -hmm. in our own illusion, et cetera. Plenty of other things to talk about. In other parts of the book, I talk about physics. If we won't end up talking about that, that's fine. Um, you, you know, how we could sort of identify if we're in a computer simulation. But since we've talked about philosophy and religion, that is sort of where I ended up thinking, but mm -hmm. it's just one person. So, and yeah. what's that called? I feel like we could have an entire episode of this about that versus the, the way I view it, which is that the reason that things are this messed right. up is, is that humans have free will. Um, and that, oh, you know, yeah. yeah. So Absolutely. it's like, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I think we could have an, a whole discussion about that that would that would last an hour and a half that that story also speaks to me on a on a level i have an anecdote that i we should have a conversation about uh at, at another time maybe off air cool. uh, initially because there's there's some uh some things in my life that i think would uh be enlightening mutually in what you just described mm -hmm. you got it you know where to find me yeah yeah fellow high school grad absolutely yes. <laughs> no it's it, it's it's great stuff but yeah if you want to turn to questions whatever by all means and yeah, that's uh, it's, it's your show, and you guys, are, this is great talking to you about this stuff. So yeah, this Likewise. is this is how I was hoping this was going to go. Um, yeah. Was that I was going to hear stuff that I had never even considered before, and that <laughs> certainly happened. Um, those cool, are yeah. usually the best conversations, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> exactly. uh, so we we planned for the show to go to uh to go to eight thirty. 
Uh, Benjamin, are you okay if it goes like 10, 15 minutes over? 20 minutes. All right, perfect. So oh, if 26 I... minutes. <laughs> All right. 26 so if, if nobody, if you have a question that you haven't input yet, I would, I would put it through as a super chat now. Uh, I did see some questions in the chat about um, not being able to use your free super chat yet. If you are a new member to the channel, you get your first free super chat after your first month. So if you subscribed on January 1st as a member, then you will get your first free super chat February 1st and so on and so forth for the rest of your time as a member of the channel. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that, that. I just wanted to kind of get that away. If you if you want to ask a question, you're worried that we won't see it in the chat, uh, which given the number of super chats we got is possible, um, then super chat is the way to do it. And uh, even even if Benjamin can't um, can't stay on for all of them, then Aiden and I at the very least will try and get to all of them. So uh, with that with that said, you want to take us through? Absolutely. So at first off, uh, at the start of the show, Cakes for four ninety nine said, "Can't watch this now. Busy wa busy watching the Lions." But here's five dollars. Thank you, Cakes. Go Lions, man. Let's let's hope. Yep. Let's hope <laughs> indeed. Uh, uh, I didn't I didn't see. I think I I think the Ravens lost. Uh yeah. Uh, yeah. did they? No, they were. Oh yeah, they did. Yeah, they yeah, were yeah, yeah. they were behind I when I looked in the at the end of the third quarter. Yep. Um, which you know is. Todd, we are putting all of our hope to avoid a a year of nothing but Taylor Swift Super Bowl memes <laughs> into the Detroit Lions. I yeah. See, One this world help. is is unreasonable. You yeah, see? exactly. Chaotic. That's that's the glitch in the simulation yeah. is that the Lions somehow made it to the the NFC Championship this yeah. year. I think anyone that grows up in Philadelphia or the Philadelphia area believes that the world's a simulation because yeah. it's so messed up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the hope that we are consistently given just to have it ripped out of our hands. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Do you want to read this one? or? Oh, boy. <laughs> Gong, who I believe his real name is Ben Krasniak, and you should have to suffer for this, said, if we're living it, and this wasn't even, you didn't even pay for this one. <laughs> If we're living in a simulation, why don't I have a six foot four inch goth dommy mommy checkmate commie? That was a lot of rhyming, which is the only reason I was willing to read it. Uh, I'll or, answer that question. I'm oh happy no. to answer these questions. <laughs> I'm surprised you comprehended it. I think I understand the gist of it. So, I'm uh, sorry. No, no. Why? Do you want me to answer that? No, yeah, please do. Go, Go ahead. for it. No. Yeah. Because in all seriousness, I always tell people that in every crazy question, there's an element of something. Really. Question is, really, if this is an illusion, why can't we will stuff into existence that we want? That's actually a really good mm -hmm. question. Be it some really perverse thing, right? <laughs> or less perverse. I often like think, like my wife and I will talk about work and money and I'll say, why can't I just will so that when I go to my first trust bank account tomorrow, there's 10,000 more dollars in it. And that's actually a serious question because, you know, I like taking crazy questions and looking mm -hmm. at serious elements. If everything is just consciousness or illusion, then I should be able to will things into existence because there's no such thing as things. Mm -hmm. It's like being in a dream and saying, What's that called when uh, lucid, lucid dreaming. dreaming? Right, lucid dreaming. Yeah, that's a good question. There are two answers to that. The skeptical answer is that we're not an illusion and it's a material universe. That's why you can't do it. The non-skeptical answer is that you haven't learned how to do it, that there are ways to do it. There's actually something called, whoever this listener is, look up tantric Taoism. So Taoism, which, you know, in, in certain forms like the form that, that I teach and the text I teach, reality is an illusion. That led historically to this branch called tantric Taoism, where they actually believe that through conscious manipulation, you could do things sexually. A big part of tantric Taoism is about sex. Mm -hmm. uh, believe that you could sort of materialize things, believe that you could make this corporeal existence immortal. These ideas are not crazy. They've been around for a long time. So however you might phrase them. So, so, yeah, for, for our generation, to understand manifesting is real and you can do it if you try hard enough. Yeah, exactly. It's manifesting. <laughs> That's the right word. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, boy. Incredible. Uh, next up would be from Dr. Candy for $5 saying, finally caught you guys live, Hog Champ. Uh, I'm at work listening as I put soup on the shelves. Where do I go to order your coffee? Ooh, Tableau Roasting Company, their website. It is uh, linked in the description. 
Nice. And then uh, we're putting slander on Ben Krasniak again because he asked for $5 again. Do you want to read that or is it my turn? At least he paid this time. It's your turn. <laughs> it's my turn. Uh, he said, my lesbian Windusi bodyguard is practicing black magic to try and bring the one that the ATF shot back to life. Any advice on how to proceed? Um, no, it sounds like witchcraft, and uh, I think that's still frowned upon in the States, so I recommend uh, I have, avoiding that situation. Where's, where's my copy of Ars Geisha? I'm summoning a demon. <laughs> I'm summoning a demon to it's you. over there. You guys know what witchcraft is all about. It's the same thing. You know, all these <laughs> traditions. I mean, you joke, but like witchcraft and all these things are ideas that through ritual and incantation, you can make stuff happen rather than physically manipulating things. I mean, this is like one of the oldest ideas ever. How Whatever perverse form of manifesting your generation may believe in. You know, it's nothing to do with your generation. These are old ideas, and many of them are really weird. Yeah, really. In fact, it's strange. We were just watching something last night about witchcraft, and my daughter said, "Like, why did people believe in witches?" I said, "Well, the whole idea is that through getting that key to the universe through the magic utterance, you can make stuff happen. It's like a uh, voodoo, where you make what's that called? You make this simulation of the thing." and damage it to damage uh, the yeah, real voodoo doll. Yeah, it's a voodoo doll. I mean, it, it's the a principle of homology. I do the thing that's like this, and the homologous, the, the analogous thing is therefore damaged. So the weird ideas, unfortunately, have been around for a long time, so. Nice. Go uh, moment point for, or sorry, $10 said, funny thing is I took a college ethics class that was completely based around the matrix simulation and simulacra, 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 simulacra. Yeah. uh, Plato's cave, or as I like to call it, Plato's rave. Uh, love it guys. God <laughs> bless. <laughs> I feel like there's definitely has been is, or will be a club somewhere called Plato's rave. That's what we call the downstairs part. <laughs> There has to be. That would be great. Right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And if not, you guys should start it. So yeah. we might have to. We're, we're working weird? on trying to buy a bar right now. Or we well, we're that. trying to we're working on trying to convince somebody else to buy a bar for us, but <laughs> which so sounds even which, way sketchy. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> there is Plato's Rave t-shirts but there doesn't seem to be a place called plato's ah, grave somebody oh. is missing an opportunity yeah. i wonder if we should add that to our memorabilia we've got occam's sh uh shaving we kit do have occam's so shaving plato's kit. rave could be yeah. a fun one day yeah. Yeah. Uh, i think a bar in phoenixville would be much much better so true. Yeah. <laughs> agreed do you guys not know uh this book simulation and simulacra no i don't know it's a cool story so i was teaching the matrix a lot of philosophy professors use that you know, use the movie and stuff it's cool it's a fun teaching tool and there's a local guy actually who wrote a book called the matrix and philosophy and it's a collection of essays it's a lot of fun anyway i was teaching this it was out in california many years ago i mean 20 some years ago and um this student of mine these were adults he was an, an older student he was like about your age and he raises his hand he goes yo you know um you ever notice in this scene where the, the ravers come over to Neo's apartment and he has like the fake software that he's going to give them mm -hmm. or the, the black market software? I go, yeah. He goes, when you're showing the movie, just stop that scene. Just pause it. I go, okay. So we do it. And you'll see that Neo brings out this book and inside it's like a diskette, right? A software diskette. And if you freeze for like a millisecond, it shows the cover of the book. And the book's title is Simulac Simulation and Simulacra. Mm -hmm. And this student who's like total stoner dude, but obviously smart guy, he says, that's a real book by this philosopher named Jean Baudrillard. So of course, years later, I read the book, French philosopher, 1970s, I guess, mm -hmm. wrote this book called Simulation and Simulacra. And the basic premise is so cool because he's not talking about physics or anything like that. But he's talking about how we live in a simulated world, you know, simulated politics, all this stuff. And this is before the Internet, mind you. But what's cool are those two words in the title. A simulation, you know what that is, right? Like, I think one of your listeners was referring to a simulated female figure, whatever, you know, all that stuff, you know, simulated Mexican food that you guys probably got from a place, you know, that 
that's not really run authentically, whatever. So what Baudrillard says is that we live in a world where they're constantly simulations, right? Mm -hmm. You can get real Chinese food, fake Chinese food. You can have like real leaders or these bogus politicians, whatever. But then Baudrillard says what happens is you have a whole generation like you guys who grow up only with the copy. The example he uses is people who go to, I guess, a Disney World or Disneyland where there's like a Venice. If you mm -hmm. guys have never been there, right? There's I've been to Epcot, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, yes. so, so you go there and there's like Venice, right? And he says, so you have a generation of people who think that Venice is Disney World, is part of it, that they don't know there's a place called Venice, Italy. Mm -hmm. And so what happens, he says, eventually this copy, the simulated place with the gondolas, takes the place of the real thing. And that's what he calls a simulacra, where the, the fake gains precedence. The example I always use, if you grow up eating McDonald's burgers your whole life, you think that that's a hamburger. Mm -hmm. That ain't a hamburger. It's not even a copy of a hamburger because you don't know what the original is. You never ate a real hamburger. So you're living in a world of simulacra, which mm -hmm. is really like beyond the pale. Interesting. And then it gets in the whole political thing, right? Like, you know, my daughter was talking with my wife today about like, who are these candidates? Like, are these even real candidates anymore? Like, what was a real candidate? When, when did we last have a real president? So, so anyway, that, that's, yeah, it's a really important Teddy. book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was Teddy. <laughs> yeah, Teddy. Yeah. The bull moose was the last one. Yeah. Teddy, yeah. I miss you. We need you. <laughs> Come back. So. Can we manifest Teddy back into existence? Please you save us, Teddy. Please Teddy save us, Teddy. Existence. Can you save us, Teddy? <laughs> it doesn't work. If you're going to manifest, manifest some money into our bank account. So yeah, right. Uh, uh, Elena well, de Howler, Werewolf Queen, which is a phenomenal username, I must name. say. Uh, for 199 said, haven't been so engaged in this stuff in a while. Glad uh, glad this podcast is resonating well, with thank people. Thank you. Glad. Alfarius Omegon, which is, again, another phenomenal username, for $5, says, fun fract. Uh, fact. Fa did I say fract? You said fract. Oh, weird. We're not fract. I'm yeah. impressed I'm not mispronouncing more words considering how the shoot went earlier. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> uh, fun fact, the phrase religious extremist is a compliment, you ruthless urban parasite. That's all, that's all one phrase. <laughs> Uh, will get you kicked out of a quote alternative church. What is an alternative church? They exist. <laughs> what, what does that mean? Like, yeah, what does is that it mean? a goth church? Yeah. <laughs> like... Well, it was Aiden who said Aiden Mattis who said when you were at the meeting, you said uh, anybody who says believe in science mm -hmm. is a total contradiction. Yeah, and so it is true that I think that list is right. Like religious extremism, it's true. Religion is the extreme thing of putting profound faith in something yeah more power yep. to it yeah it's, it's, religion should be extreme that's funny yeah it's whereas science is like you can't believe science because science is a, a process of understanding of doubt <laughs> and doubt yeah you yeah. can believe the results of the scientific process but you can't believe science <laughs> that's right yeah he said that i was like you said that it was spot on i just thought it was great uh, Los Barai for four ninety nine says, if this is a simulation or game that we live in, then I demand access to my character customization panel. I need a stronger spine so I can fly <laughs> jets. Dude, if your if your spine is the reason you can't fly jets, you you have completely skipped most of the normal problems. I'm impressed. Yeah, that's fair. Hey, <laughs> if I may interject a serious note, then mm -hmm. again, so here's something that that people have thought about: why can't you again will yourself? To be physically different right so they've done they did a really cool experiment where they held somebody's arm out and they were hypnotized and they said we are holding a match near your arm you are blistering and the person started to blister which shows that psyche right mind abstract immaterial non-physical can manifest physically so there's a lot of belief now that you can will yourself better will yourself sick Absolutely. So why not? You know, there's definitely a question of this question, you know, abstract, immaterial stuff being uh, soma is the Greek word, mm -hmm. right? Being able to affect the soma, the body. So give it a try. There are a million people out there who will give you exercises to do that. You know, the whole Zen meditation thing, that's what it's all about. So makes sense. Whispering Tingles for $20 says, The Egg by Andy Weir, a very thought-invoking short story. 
I will have to look into the egg. Oh yeah, yeah. That's very. That's uh, that's very. Can I say this? Your generation. Yeah. Yeah. Am I allowed? Am I being ages? No, 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 not even close. We're, We're not sure yeah. what our generation is. It's fine. We are also ageist against our generation, so you're not alone here. All right, because the the and egg also is all like, of the other ones. <laughs> yeah, it's a very <laughs> morbid story. It's is a very morbid story. I think again, it's probably my 18 year old who told me about that. I'll but... have to read it. Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. it's it's astounding. I read so much, but I have not read for pleasure in. Well, you don't have time. Over a year. Yeah, you don't have time. And I had that trouble while I was while I was a student. I never had time to read. And then yeah. one of the great things about being older, you can finally read stuff you want. So yeah. I cannot wait until I am at least yeah. semi-retired and, and yeah. can start my mornings with a cup of coffee and a book instead of a cup of coffee and sitting down in front of my computer to just learn about the worst thing to ever happen to people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the nature of the beast. <sighs> Yeah, we really are kind of our own version of a procedural show at this point, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> it is like a detective show, is it not? A little bit, yeah. yeah at this yeah, point, yeah, it's yeah. very much becoming a detective show because yeah. now we're just doing okay. police department's jobs for them. Kind yeah. of. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, we covered one. The, the one that's coming out Friday is like, you look through everything and you're like, there is there is no way this was an accidental drowning. There is, there is actually physically, provably, objectively no way this man drowned accidentally. And the cops are like, ah, well, I mean, it's we didn't really try to figure out if somebody killed him, but nobody walked in and said, I killed the guy, so it must have been an accident. Like, yeah. that is the extent of their investigation. You just, you go, what? Well, <laughs> everything is about, you know, desire to do stuff. You know, well, you and I talked about this, I think, on the last show, like some listener asked, you know, why does some stuff get investigated, others not, be it archaeology mm -hmm. or crime, whatever. It, it's all, you know, pro QE bono, know who benefits from doing it. And so it's it's completely random, apparently, from the outside. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's unsolved, uninvestigated. You know, some of it's pretty horrible. Other is just more academic. Yeah. So that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Killing the official data for $22.30. Love this I like that one. Uh, is the idea of our lives being a simulation really that far off when I see us in the next 15 to 30 years doing similar experiments with AI, either intentionally or by video game NPC AIs becoming self-aware inside a game sim? Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's I mean, that, the thing yeah. is, like, when you think about it, simulation theory doesn't feel... I, I mean, I think as a Christian, it's ridiculous for me to sit here and say simulation theory is ridiculous because my, my version is just a simulation theory with morals. Yeah, like yeah, right. it's just, right. just a, yeah. a simulation with a Y. Yeah, but basically, like right. m mine has morals and a, an afterlife, whereas the the average simulation theorist probably sits there and goes, ah, there's no real rules, and once it's over, it's over. That's another. That's yeah. a sticking point I was thinking of earlier when we were in discussion. There just wasn't time to interject it. it might be better yeah. to bring this up in another conversation in a longer format. But I think that's an interesting contention between the two. Of you know, I I'm not as familiar with simulation theory's idea of the beyond, but like, you know, right. with Christianity and other religions having an afterlife in that form where you still are, as I understand, your conscious self, but in a soul mm -hmm. in another place. Whereas from what I understand with simulation theory, it's more of a, a perpetuation or, or I, I can't remember which specific religion it is with reincarnation. That would be um, yeah. Buddhism. It is Buddhism. Okay. I didn't want to misrepresent well, that. And Buddhism other. and Hinduism both have Hinduism, reincarnation. Yeah, Hinduism, yeah. 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 Buddhism has reincarnation, right? Yeah, but it, 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 it has it because it's built on top of the Hindu substructure. Right. You know, Buddhism is just the teachings of the Buddha, mm -hmm. but just like Christianity draws from the pagan traditions when it comes into places like encounters the the, the Celts, etc. Mm -hmm. So too Buddhism just draws all that Hindu sort of typology. Um, gotcha. That's what you're saying. Right. Yep. Yeah. It's not inherent in Buddhist philosophy by any means. Yeah. So. Miss Mori for $5 says, if I had a nickel for every time one of my podcasts went deep philosophical this week, I'd have two, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. <laughs> which well, this, one was, this, this one was definitely intended to get deeply philosophical. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's why I'm here. That's why I got the, the degree in this. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Norberto Rodriguez Jr. for $10 says, gamers test the game physics for how realistic it is and do bizarre things to see if there are consequences to unorthodox actions, such as, i.e., no reaction to basket placed on NPCs in Skyrim. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, we do we do often test the boundaries of our our environment, try to understand things. I mean, we've and and what sticks out to me is for thousands upon thousands of years, you have stories of people, you know, disappearing and then reappearing hundreds of years later. You have oh, yeah, you all like of these that. little glitches, you yeah, know, yeah. like. You start to wonder, definitely, you know, is our people, it, is this world in which we exist as concrete and solid as we seem to believe it is? Or is it possible that whether you believe that it's a computer program or that there are multiple dimensions at play here and it's possible to slip between them? We, we have a long history as a species of contemplating the idea of traveling between different dimensions and traveling through time and things like that. I mean, going back but, to it, the, the voyage of Bran is dates back to probably the 700s. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's yeah. And there are many, many different stories like that. Some of the more encoded in sort of mythological structure, like even Rip Van Winkle, right? That story. But it, it's interesting because, you know, whoever posed that that comment, it's really this gets back to what we're talking about consistency, that mm -hmm. what we say is real is what is consistent. So what is missing in this experience is lack of consistency. You know, somebody like Aiden Mattis, you know, if you listen to his show, he's always looking for these marked in inconsistencies. You know, people who disappear, mm -hmm. like who's the guy that walks behind his carriage and then vanishes? Um, I think it's in the 19th century. This is famous case like that. Right, but you know, you've looked in your show about a number of things where mm -hmm. it's just these odd disappearances and stuff, and they're not really explainable. Or as you say, they disappear and they reappear somewhere else, which yeah. defies the physically consistent laws. So let me just interject here because this was something I wanted to mention during the course of the show. So when you look at, you know, and I don't know if the audience is interested in sort of hard and fast physics, but one of the interesting things is that in physics, they're trying to take that idea really seriously and find an inconsistency. Mm -hmm. So one of them is the, this famous experiment called the double slit experiment, you know, where they shoot photons, you know, through these slits. You probably did this in high school at Episcopal. So one of the interpretations of that is, you know, when you shoot, you're just shooting single photons, you still get what's called an interference pattern, which you should only get from two sources. You know, so for years and years, people say, well, this is because it's like, well, it's another world or it's the role of the observer. You know, there's all this kind of verbiage used to explain it. And I realized when I was writing the book that a much simpler explanation for something that's clearly not consistent, because you should have interference patterns only when you have two wave sources, that the real answer is there is another wave source. And it's because our reality is mediated through some like device. The thing in the book, I just call it like VR goggles. Mm -hmm. So you have somebody looking at something. So in the book, I talk about if ever you watch TV and on the TV, somebody's being interviewed and in the background are our old computer monitors, the CRT monitors, and you notice that the screen kind of ripples like this. And that's because the scanning rate of your television and the scanning rate of the computer don't match. And so you get an uh, interference pattern. So if you were to ask me, and I'm the news reporter and you said, what are those weird patterns in the computer behind mm -hmm. you? I wouldn't see anything, mm -hmm. but you do. Therefore, you could conclude that you're looking at me through a mediation, through a television. Mm -hmm. And so that's all that's happening in our reality. There's stuff that is going on that doesn't fit, maybe even the disappearances, whatever you choose it. Those are kind of, I, won't, I don't like to use the word proofs, but they are indications that our reality is mediated, simulated, something like that. So I think there are things that are not particularly weird that would be indicative of, of something being amiss in mm -hmm. this. We just well, we have to look for it. And then one additional thing about the double split experiment that, or slit experiment that I'm curious uh, if you're aware of and if you have any thoughts on it was, I remember, I think it was Neil deGrasse Tyson was talking about it somewhere, but he was referring to uh, further replications of that experiment. Uh, they realized that the frequency of the photons hitting on certain slits changed whether or not people were observing it. Right. Which, right. which in and of itself is interesting because at that point it's giving credence to your but change point. depended on whether or not people. Correct. Were, yeah. yeah. So right. if it yeah. was being observed, there was a. I, it sounded like you right. were saying yeah. whether yeah. or not people observed it depended on. No, 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 no. Yeah, sorry, yeah, no, the no, way no. you phrased it. Got it, got it. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. The, the pattern was different whether or not somebody was observing it. 
which yeah. is interesting in and of itself because then it's like okay well what what is the because clearly the existence of a human perceiving it in some distance from it occurring has right. some form of interference that is changing Correct. the outcome and yeah. you have to wonder it's like okay well what what frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum is emanating from us or causing that interference and it's like you know but i'm saying it could be even simpler than that because think like you guys i guess your your video gamers just think about if you're really close to the screen it looks one way and if you're farther from the screen it looks another way it's just a perceptual thing or i don't know if you wear like special kind of glasses when you work on the computer what are those things that block the blue light oh yeah the blue light glasses yeah Right. So just imagine you're wearing that all the time. That's going to affect the thing. And then if you take them off, all of a sudden stuff looks different. Mm -hmm. So it's really just that this medium, which I'm not even aware of after I've worn glasses for so long, I'm not even aware. But suddenly I realized, oh, wait, my existence is mediated. And so there's interference coming from this that's creating something on the screen that's actually not there. So it can be a very fundamental physical thing not nothing to do with consciousness or even electromagnetic radiations it's just that there's something in between me and the phenomenon that i don't even realize is stuck on my head mm -hmm. right here it is right here causing this like so yeah it's interesting how physics is just wrestled with this and wrestled with this and there are many different interpretations but i think the ultimate answer to this is going to be much simpler than we think like most things usually are so yeah absolutely be weird but simple yeah occam shaving kit occam shaving kit <laughs> yet again uh um, t-shirts yeah we, we uh, did we start doing those t-shirts yet nah there's uh, we're having some issues with the website still Got it. um they should be available uh actually i can i can, I can steal a uh thing Fair enough. here and i can go to in the meantime, Melanie Mead became a new member. Thank you, and gave us one ninety nine. But I'm not seeing a question, so if you did intend to write a question, uh, feel free to just drop it in chat uh, now, and I'll keep an eye on it. See if uh, you know it, it recycles in. Uh, if you're just donating to me, nice. Thank you very much. But if there was a question, I'll keep an eye out so that way I can ask it after uh, the following. Uh, Elena De Howler, Werewolf Queen for one ninety nine, says, "Book of Enoch inspired Lore Lodge video, please." Oh yeah, definitely. Do it, do it. I think I think it would be fun. I think we've had conversations on uh, another channel that we do with uh, a YouTuber by the name of Wendigoon. Some of us here know him as Isaiah, uh, called the Weird Bible, where we talk about different elements of the Bible. And you know, uh, they provide Isaiah was uh, you know a bit of a scholar for uh, the Bible prior. He brings more of a history side, and then I kind of look at it from a, a little bit more of a secular and, and psychological side, and just kind of we provided that kind of. Uh, continuum for people to be able to find accessible ways to the scripture to engage with it in some level of productivity so like at the worst case scenario you can look at it from like a secular perspective of like okay these are really interesting stories that have some wisdom and some you know true you know lessons that can be learned uh from there or you can go all the way to the to the biblical side and really engage with your faith more um but yeah we'd like to we like to keep that interesting so we've talked about enoch a bit on that show uh was there a dedicated show about enoch uh i think so uh, I, th I feel like it exists up there you should definitely do another one because also i mean it's so and if he ever does the freemasonic show there's a big connection between the book of enoch and, and freemasonry Mm -hmm. and, oh really? I mean, in the book of yeah, and the book of Enoch opens up so much. It's like, why was it written? What does it mean? And, you know, the thing I'm always interested in when I read these things is like, why are they so weird? Mm -hmm. Like, people read weird stuff, but you got to ask yourself, like, why is it so weird? Like, the book of Enoch, you're reading this, and it was written obviously a very long time ago. It's like, why would somebody write something so weird? And what's the point they're trying to make? And then, sort of, your perspective is is there a psychological aspect and then historically like why is it not something we teach in sunday school you know to use that yeah. expression i didn't learn it at episcopal but uh no i th yeah i think it's it's totally worth looking at uh not saying that it's like a conspiracy theory to keep it out of religious teaching because i think that's unproductive mm -hmm. but on the other hand anything written by humans like that there's something there's a reason that it's there and it's worth digging into. I got really into the book of Enoch from our other conversation. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned it when we're doing the lost knowledge thing, because it's all about 
how is it the Elohim who give knowledge to mankind and then you know they're punished for it yeah it's filled with like you, you guys saw the movie Prometheus right yeah it's essentially that whole story um yeah yeah, I mean, these the Bible stories are like the best mm -hmm. science fiction, and I don't mean it fictional as in made up. Yeah, but I mean in exploring really interesting themes really well. Yeah. People should respect that. Yeah, I, I do. Also, I agree. I think everybody, I think everybody who's seeking to understand either Christianity or Judaism should look at the stuff that's from the intertestamental period, like Enoch, because yeah. it's just the stuff that you that you get through reading those things whether you're reading enoch or maccabees or or anything else along those lines that was written between between 500 bc and the the writing of the new testament there's so much in there that at the very least even if you don't take it as as scripture as inspired writing if you look at it purely as all right well this is just stuff that was basically written as commentary um it's still important because it tells you what people living during that period thought how they believed right in their faith and why did they believe these things are there books that they had that we have lost you know where mm -hmm. did they get ideas from from somewhere else if so how why how does that fit in um i think the idea that those those shouldn't be read is insane whether you're you know right. part of the religion or you're somebody who's simply or you're interested yeah um yeah but I, but I think also, everybody should read, yeah. you know, the, the the books of the big three religions. You got Christianity, Islam, and, and Hinduism are the three biggest religions in the world. Everybody should probably have a, at the very least, a fundamental understanding of what those belief systems are, because it's simply going to help you to understand your fellow man, whether they are, you know, in in the Western world, in the Middle East, or in East Asia. Well, and remember, too, that those things are all being written in the struggle just like the three of us were talking about at the beginning of this the struggle to understand what is the nature of our existence because also i think what what happens like you know other aiden brought up this thing about consciousness at some point homo sapiens become very conscious of their situation just as a whole right just like a little kid does humanity as a whole at some point probably about fifty thousand years ago says whoa i'm alive what does mm -hmm. this mean and so there are all these narratives that are written that are, are struggling with this. So we, we need to read them all. And the other thing that I think that that's important is that human beings, you know, there is this, or this goes back to the other discussion we had. There's this kind of meta story where human beings have this weird feeling that there's something more to life than just the fact that here we are on this planet. Like there was some prior civilization or there were these angelic beings and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And that, and one of the things that always concerns me, and I'm not even particularly religious, is that we live in such a, a dialectically materialist world. Everything is transactional. Mm. Everything is like cause and effect, that there's no mystery in it. Not that we are adding mystery because we're bored, but we're adding mystery because our basic situation is really mysterious. And I think the people in the old days had more cojones to say, yeah, this is mysterious. We need to ask some questions. We're going to write some narratives to kind of play these questions out. And, and those are all just pushed away because the world becomes divided into purely spiritual belief system, dialectic, materialist, capitalist, communist, mm -hmm. you know, ground level stuff. Whereas the Book of Enoch and things like that are, are works that are sort of struggling with things. And mm -hmm. that's the place to be is questioning and struggling. So. Right. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Kellen, the official data for $2.23, nice, uh, said 13th floor is a better rep sim theory right. than Matrix. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I have not seen or read either. So well, I've seen the Matrix, floor, but only the first one. Yeah, 13th floor came out, I think, almost at the same time, which made it suffer as a film. So it wasn't as popular a film. And uh, I think, though whoever this was that wrote this in yeah it's it's sort of better at directly addressing this idea of a simulation one of the reasons for that listener is that it's based on a really cool science fiction novel um whose title is escaping me now if you look up 13th floor there was a novel that was written really early again like late 50s early 60s and then there's a german tv series called world on a wire like 
Welt und Welt, I forget what it's called in German, that really plays the simulation thing out really, really well. So it's as if, you know, it takes it very re realistically. Like if tomorrow we found out this was a simulation, what would we do? How would we uh, react? So absolutely worth saying. Totally, totally. Ryan Whitcup for five dollars and sixty four cents. Nice says, "Can we get a God as a gamer T shirt as uh, as well as a God hates the IRS shirt?" Also, let's go Lions twenty four to seven right now. Uh, thank you for reminding me. I have to send an email to Bunker Branding. <laughs> My wife works for the IRS. Can't have that T shirt. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Has she considered a career shift? <laughs> Has she, she considered erasing the... everyone's taxes, <laughs> making it so we've already paid? <laughs> now, now. Again, you can will that into existence <laughs> if, if you wish, but it, it, it doesn't work. God is gamer. Is that, that's just cruel. I mean, again, you guys are Gnostics. If you're thinking that God is a gamer, then you are a Gnostic. <laughs> okay, and just sign up. Stop pretending that you think this is new. People always think they're inventing this stuff is new. It's like, yeah, the idea that we're game pieces goes way, way back. Right? It's true. I mean, it on, does. It's true. <laughs> Norberto Rodriguez Jr. for five dollars says, "If the world is a simulation, then where is the player character, or who they are, and what are they capable of?" So I guess that. I mean, Explain so I guess that. the 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 question is kind of essentially along the lines of like, if it is a game, he he's looking at it from the perspective of uh, it's a single player game where everyone yeah. else is an NPC except yeah. for the one person who's actually actively playing the game. So uh, yeah. Norbert is kind of asking, who is that? How do we know yeah. who it is? And what are they capable of doing? That's an old question. I mean, not old as in bad. It's a, it's a deep philosophical question, a really old question. So one of the conjectures is you, Norberto, mm -hmm. are, are, are the player. We're all, you know, uh, creations of the simulation. And that's it. The other is that we are all can I use this word? Is this dorky? Like we're all avatars and we're, there's a player behind each of us. Mm -hmm. So we're there. I don't do video games at all. So we're each then interacting with each other or that everything are just simulations, including him. Mm -hmm. He just, it was programmed to feel that he has some consciousness, which he doesn't really have, et cetera. And, and again, this gets back to, you know, a serious point, I think is how do we substantiate this? Like, how does he prove that he's the dreamer and we're the dream? Mm -hmm. Right. And so the short answer is right now, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we don't know. You know, he should do some tests. Scroll back up That's why in the book I mentioned tests, you know, yeah. he should do some tests, try to push the envelope, you know, delete Aiden's character and, and see what happens. So. Alt F4. Huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I like that question. Um, and I think it really depends on, you know, your which which belief system you subscribe to, because if you're. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you're a, uh, a Gnostic, then you're probably going to take a, a more a position more that you are a, a cog in the machine and there is a player character above you. Um, if you're a Christian, then you're probably going to take it as I'm the player character. We're all player characters. And, you know, the the, the angels and the, the angels are like mods and God is the developer. Um, you know, there's, if we're putting it into video game terms, I think it really depends on your belief system. I personally would argue that, you know, it's, you know, we're looking at it essentially that, you know, God is the, the developer of the game and then the angels and the, the, the Elohim beneath him are, you know, maybe the, God, I don't know, like the, the, the PR team, the dev team that supports him. And then you've got us and we're the people who are actually playing the game. Um, so it, it really depends yeah, yeah. on what your belief system is. I, I, yeah. I come from that belief system that, you know, God created the whole thing, but all of us have agency. We all have free will and we're, we're running around just trying to do our best to, to win in a game with rules that are essentially be a good person until you die. Um. Well, and also that, I mean, again, we, we could like shift the discussion to a much more religious thing. So wait, let me just mention, so. The, the correct term I'd look this up is solipsism, you know, the belief that you are the, the only player and then everything else is like your creation and manipulation. So if, if the, the listener was in Oberto, yes. so if, if, if he felt that you know, that's possible, that's called solipsism, if you want to look it up. What Aiden is talking about brings up a whole nother interesting issue, which is that then, it, you know, it's not so cruel, which I like because now I'm a sympathetic person, that the creator creates us with a sense of agency. 
But then you could have a whole program on what that means because it, you know, again, I think this is another thing that people really don't understand is what the Adam and Eve story is all about. So the idea is that when Adam is created, Adam is does not really have a sense of agency. And so it's almost as if you we want to do this terrible thing of God as a gamer. God would not be satisfied with that, not just because it would be no fun, mm -hmm. but it's like I was explaining to a student the other day. It's also, you can't have the concept of love like that. Like the whole idea that God creates something outside of him or itself is because that's the only way love is possible to create something external to oneself. So that's the first thing. Like I create a baby and you know, the baby's going to love me. No worries. But the real test is to give that baby a consciousness and sense of agency and see if they come back and acknowledge me. You guys are grown up and I assume you still have your parents around. You know, I hope so. If you go to them like tomorrow, their house and say, you know, mom, dad, I still love you. They'll be blown away by that way more than when you were really little hugging mm -hmm. them because now they know you're conscious agents with choice, et cetera. And so in the biblical narrative, it's the same thing. God not only wants to create Adam, give Adam consciousness, then give Adam Eve. So Adam's attention sort of diverted away to this woman mm -hmm. and then still see whether they return to God or not. The entire history of humanity is this game of seeing, will human beings not just be good, mm -hmm. as you said, which true, but will human beings turn back to their creator and say, we love you? Mm -hmm. If you read the New Testament, I mean, it's just the story of Jesus coming down and saying, I think you forgot the rules of the game. The mm -hmm. rules of the game or the parameters of the game, I should say, were to see if you will do that. And, you know, it's, it's a parent-child relationship throughout the entire biblical mm -hmm. narrative. And it's a question of, you know, do we do that or do we kind of go off the grid and just be some selfish and et cetera, et cetera. It's weird, by the way. One, one of the things I didn't mention during this whole discussion, you guys should look up this guy, Donald Hoffman. I think he's mm -hmm. at uh, University of Southern California. He's an experimental psychologist. He does all this stuff. And when he's interviewed on YouTube, man, he talks about religion like heavy duty mm -hmm. because his whole research into consciousness and, and meaning of life really went in the direction that Aiden's talking about, you know, mm -hmm. whether you believe it or not, it's just interesting to see. So this is in the, it's in the zeitgeist for sure. I'm not sure where I stand on that. You know, the religious thing I, I love for what it is. And then I do the science thing, but yeah, there's, there's overlap. So mm -hmm. that's, that's God, the gamers idea. If you believe he's a gamer, then most of us have totally forgotten what, <laughs> blazed as the game is that uh, yeah. that'll stay for sure so. yeah i mean it's a it's a very good point when you look at the the biblical narrative of why we were created it is it is not to a, a lot of people have have it mixed up and think that like Mil, uh milton was was the bible and that we were created as a a part of a bet between satan and, and right, god right, and right, all that and it's right. like no it's if you look at it god's pretty pretty direct he's like ah well we've created all of this and now it's time to create uh some people to run it they need free will i would like them to be uh on you know able to converse with me i would like to be active and a participant in their lives and also because they have free will and i'm not going to give them the knowledge of good and evil immediately uh i must also make sure they have a way to ascertain the knowledge of good and evil if they so choose but tell them that they probably shouldn't. And here we are. <laughs> right. And anybody and now who's I have to go pay taxes. <laughs> Stop worrying about your taxes. Anybody I'm worried about my taxes. <laughs> anybody who has had children would understand this process, unless you're a total psychopath mm -hmm. or sociopath. Because when you have a kid, that's the exact pattern of having a kid. You have a kid, you want them to have their own will, their own education, their own desires, et cetera. But also you want them to constantly reflect back and, and and look at you not in a narcissistic way mm -hmm. but in a way like a relationship like i created this but now you've created yourself and etc so it should ironically you know it should be a no-brainer but it, it's not it's very difficult for people um and that that's one of the things that puzzles me so much like i can understand people who haven't had kids yet because you haven't really loved something so external to yourself and yet so close to you but once you have kids, it's like, come on, man, you got to get it. But obviously it's meaningless because most people still don't get it. You know, it's just not mm -hmm. happening. So, yeah, I mean, you could have you could have a whole show just 
creation. So yeah, think about that for for sure. So it's yeah, absolutely. Party like it's 1776 for five dollars says as as a Detroiter, I'm proud to say that we are currently winning 24 to seven Detroit all the way. Congrats. What time did the game start? Uh, seven, I think. Wait, why are we cheering for Detroit? Just because we hate Baltimore? No, Detroit's playing uh, San Francisco. Okay. We were cheering for Baltimore earlier. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it's, no, we, we want Detroit because we, we want a story that isn't the 49ers who play extremely dirty football and oh, complain right. every single time they oh, lose yeah. that it was okay. unfair. Oh, no, uh, okay. We don't want them in the Super Bowl, and we also don't want the camera to pan to Taylor Swift every single time something happens. Uh, you know, so we're hoping that the Lions can can make the Chiefs very sad as well. Okay. Yep. Also, Taylor... it's because Detroit really hasn't had a yeah. lot of success in their oh, entire the history. Underdog. Yeah, okay. they're they're yeah. the under as a Philadelphian. You know, the, yeah, we we yeah. had this same story six years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I'm I'm sitting here. I'm like, you know what? They they deserve it. They deserve yeah. it. They should get it. Yeah. yeah. I was telling somebody that people don't understand, like, why we support the underdog is like, because we are the underdog 99% of the time. It's it's very funny. Yeah, I know. I totally get that. That's good. You got people, you got listeners from Detroit. That's great. Yeah. Oh, we, it's, it's actually been really cool to watch. We, uh, we can see the breakdown of where everyone's from and we've kind of watched it go from like 95% United States. And then the other remaining five was Canada, Britain, Australia, Germany, for some reason, um, which I think is cool. I'm not complaining. I was just like weird that the fourth is Germany. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So it started off there, and and now we're I think we're into the sixty percent. We're we're sixty some percent of our viewers are American, and everybody, the remaining thirty some are speed. from other countries, which yeah, is just wild. I think there have been some people no, from like great. Croatia and stuff. Yeah. We get a really lot, good. a lot of Europe. Yeah. A lot of Eastern Eastern Europe people who I guess you know speak English and I uh, and appreciate oh, yeah, American yeah. media, but. You know, don't you know? Obviously, you're from another part of the country. Among young people, in certain places in Europe, Eastern Europe in particular, Portugal, Scandinavia, mm -hmm. Iceland is really high, and so they consume American media like it's going out of style. Yeah, um, yeah. I found you know, I do a lot of music, and most of my music has sold overseas. Like a mm. tremendous number of songs and EPs I've sold mm. overseas. No way. Nice. Yeah, Venezuela, like weird places, Venezuela, Israel, Italy, it's just very random. So, that's, that's fun. cool. Yeah. It's absolutely. the good thing about the internet. Yeah. The good thing. Little yeah. good things. <laughs> yeah. sure going There's good and bad. <laughs> uh, find, yeah, okay, so it has gone up in the last 28 days that we're um, primarily, it, it's now up to 73% U.S., but yeah, 5% from Canada, 5% from the U.K., almost 3 from Australia, 1.4 from Germany. It's just, you know, there's, it's really cool to see the breakdown, and, you know, like, it, it's not like all English-speaking countries in the top, oh. the top 10. It's, you know, yeah. we've got Germany, Poland, Sweden, South Africa, Brazil. I see Ireland in there. Ireland's in there, yeah. It's Are cool. you Irish? I am, yeah. Well, it's it's. I just did an ancestry thing. Is like I knew I was Irish, but it's funny because there's a, a number of German names in my family, and there's there's definitely a decent amount of German heritage. But for whatever reason, and I guess it's just you, you know who lived in PA at that right. time. Uh, but almost all of the German men and their lineages married Irish women in yeah, like okay. two sides of my family. Tell me, uh, she's German and Irish. Yeah, I mean, my dad's grandparents were off the boat irish and uh you know there's some heavy irish in there but there's also a surprising amount of english uh so that was that was cool to say but yeah mostly okay. irish english and german actually all oh, irish english and german mm -hmm. uh, i was telling somebody the other day i'm russian and ukrainian mixed so mm -hmm. Ooh. I, I constantly Ooh. feel like indigestion well, <laughs> wait, I, I love telling this story because i was at camp one year and there was another camp there that was like a a, a exchange camp of some sort but we could not for the life of us figure out where these people were from the language sounded completely unfamiliar to us uh but at first we we thought it was maybe like brazilian portuguese uh but finally we decided to go over and sit and you know be say hi and be like hey where are you guys from and it turned out that uh the the group was from russia and the one guy goes you know oh we are we are all from russia and then one guy you know starts stands up and starts yelling something we obviously it sounds russian to us but we don't know uh, and the, the guy we're talking to, Sergey, goes, "Oh, and he is Ukrainian." <laughs> and, <laughs> and even though uh, the language, no, no, you, you, like... you need to understand what year this was. Yeah. Uh, I believe this was summer of 2015. 
so so the worst thing anyone could possibly say at that moment was something along the lines of i don't know uh oh that must be really awkward for you guys because of like you know the war (laughs) and then we all turn to noel (laughs) go why would you say those words i know just like (laughs) and she's like i I don't know i didn't know what else to say we were like anything but that (laughs) specifically you you could have said any words but those ones and it would have been a better scenario than what we're because at that moment i mean it just erupted into like people are almost like fist fighting yeah terrible she wanted to stir the pot it seems whether she knew it or not well she was from boston (laughs) uh um, yeah Uh, next one we have is from Fluttershy Fury for $20. Thank you. Uh, sorry, off topic, but wondering if the lore of the Superstition Mountains, Missing and Murdered People, the Lost Dutchman, and the Native American Curse, uh, would be an episode consideration. Thanks and love the show. That does sound good. Superstition Mountains is one that's come up a lot what recently, is so. Is it, um, is that a place? Is it a thing? Yes. Okay. <gasps> Never heard of this. You wanna, do you want to give a quick overview i don't know anything about it okay got it so yeah that's one of those things that i just i just don't know so yeah just put that in there um put it put it into the content sheet and we'll it's not anything just 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 type in superstition mountains in the content sheet just Uh, just do that never heard of it just don't worry about it and it's not typing oh wait is it never heard of these things weird yeah a lot of it's that kind of niche like weird stuff that's happened oh. kind of vibe arizona uh, uh pablo raul uh, Pereira. you have to uh pablo raul one. Pereira. yes uh, Pereira. 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 yeah uh, oh, thank, thank you remember thank you uh cam boone member it for eight months thank you. thank you uh says late to the show tonight but glad to be here anyways keep it up fellas stoked for the new weird bible thank it's you. coming it's uh it's about samson yeah this one's about the story of samson yeah. Yeah, yeah, should be fun. You you get to watch all three of us just lose it for a solid five minutes over over the phrase "Who hath done this?" So get ready for that. Yeah, um, it'll be a fun one. Uh, Doctor Candy for five dollars says thoughts about physicalism versus dualism for you all. Would you think oh, it? Uh, would you think it would be accurate to say our personalities are just programming if it is phys- uh, physicalism? I'm not sure I understand the terminology. Yeah, it I'm, seems I'm you do. It. Yeah, of course I do. I got to teach this stuff. So, and there was actually a great BBC podcast about this just the other day. So, dualism is this idea that we have a physical aspect and then we have a mind, which is abstract, right? Mm-hmm. And so, how can the mind sort of reside in this physical thing? Okay, so sort of I what like, like Avicenna was talking about. Yeah, more or less. You know, it's, again, these are old, old questions. But yeah, you know, the example I always use is a very simple one because when I was your age, I was deeply in love with this woman, and it was a disastrous relationship. And I literally worried myself sick, and I had mm-hmm. terrible ulcers, which shows that your psyche can affect your soma. Yeah. Purely physicalism is basically saying that we're just machines, mm-hmm. right? And when I am in love or happy, it's just a certain balance of chemicals that create these certain reactions that manifest in a certain way. And that's it. Um, That we are just literally no more than machines following programs. Mm -hmm. And this has been unresolved. It's been debated for hundreds of years. Still is not resolved. I should say for the sake of listeners question that I think that now science leans towards a very heavy physicalist model Mm -hmm. because most young people, unfortunately, a lot of young people deal with depression and anxiety the primary treatment mode is medication. Mm -hmm. And you do that because you believe that this is a mechanical process in the body, whether it is and it is not is totally that I'm not a medical expert. All I'm saying Mm -hmm. is that seems to be the dominant belief system. Now, whether it's going to be proven correct Mm -hmm. or not is up for grabs. So it's a really, really interesting question. Yeah. I I would definitely personally fall more on the dualist side of that then now that i i understand the ter- understand the terminology being used yeah. uh, i i don't have necessarily a good concise explanation for why it just when when i think about the world and the the interactions i've had with other human beings versus the interactions i've had with animals 
uh to or me thing. there's yeah there's a distinct yeah. difference when you're dealing with another another person another being with sentience than when you're dealing with an animal i can predict exactly how my dog is going to behave at all times um what i can't do is predict exactly how aiden's going to behave at all times even though i've known right. him for over a decade so it's it, it like I, I think that there's there's something that i cannot adequately describe sitting here right now that maybe if i sat down with a a notepad and a few hours and, and thought about it i could i could explain but it, it, to me it's there's got to be something something going on spiritually that are but also, we're remember, not just a product of our our chemistry in my opinion yeah, and if, if you're religious you pretty much will believe in in the narrative of a physical creation imbued with spirit and i should say there's a third mm -hmm. option too which is that everything is spirit and yeah. the physicality is illusory so there's that option too which is that even if you're religious you could say god created the illusion of physicality but we're pure mm -hmm. spirit and that's what we will return to eventually so yeah. yeah anybody who is religious can't be a mechanist can't be yeah. materialist that that would just be strange no very, very wouldn't strange. make sense yeah yeah, I don't but, know where I land because there have been a number of different experiences and instances in my life that l could literally lead me down all three of those options. And it's just a matter of essentially, I guess, moving forward and deciphering which one is the most likely in yeah. my perspective. But I think the fact, I, I, I guess maybe one way to put it is I think the fact that we have the ability to understand what is the most expedient thing for us, what is the the thing that is arguably best for us individually and choose not to do it because it might be bad to, for somebody else, somebody that we care about or even somebody that we don't care about. You know, I, I try not to buy items that were made in China because I know that people who make those items are often suffering in near slave conditions. Um, so I try to buy stuff that's made in, in America if possible. Um, you know, it's, it's stuff like that, that I'm like the cheaper option is for me to buy the, the Chinese stuff. You know, it's, it's probably going to function just fine, but it was made unethically. So the fact that I have the ability to think through that and to make decisions that go against what is I uh, what my body needs biologically, what what would make the most sense from an evolutionary perspective, I think suggests that there is more to us than our physical existence. Right. Yeah. So and again, that's a unpopular view. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I would I would agree, of course. But it, I just yeah, I, I guess I, I am very dogmatic about this because the the, the adherence to materialism and, and belief in mechanistic interpretations of things in our society is like really profound. It's, it's shocking how profound, particularly, and I'm going to be ageist, young people should be the most opposite of this. And yet they're often the ones who are most secular, mechanist, materialist, dialectic, you know, believers, it, which scares the, the hell out of me. You, I think you, it, you it should makes, not see that way when you're young. I think you know? the issue there is that it makes sense having grown up in the information and technology era, you know, when you're, when you're growing up surrounded by it and surrounded by reasons to believe that this, this is what it is. is it? And, you know, science, right. like you said earlier, science leans mostly towards the, the physicalism, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when it is kind of, you know, uh, to borrow your phrase from earlier in the night, when it's in the zeitgeist, you know, yeah. it's, it's hard to escape that. So I think that Absolutely. might be part of it is it's, it's whether intentionally or not it's ingrained into our perception of the world around us mm -hmm. um yeah. but yeah who knows who knows how much or if that will change as as new generations arise uh yeah the next one is from miss maury for five dollars saying heard an interesting theory that the future is easy so they raise their kids in the past where it's easier to learn to appreciate what we will have i know oh that God. so i know that theoretically time travel That's to the future cool. is possible but there shouldn't be a physical there shouldn't be a way to time travel to the past right i feel like this is more metaphorical yeah, yeah it is but you yeah it, i mean if I, I could understand like if you were going from like a they have incubation chambers where your body is given everything it needs while you experience a life through an ai in the past yeah like that i can see but well, i mean yeah but you're correct off your supposition based on the theory of relativity given yeah. the idea that like you can accelerate yourself to near the light future. speeds mm -hmm. and then so that way your perception of time slows because of the you know uh, as we believe now the ultimate speed limit of the universe being uh light speed so you know you can only go to that speed at any given vector so if you start going in that way one direction the processes in your body must slow down to accommodate therefore 
you exist in this kind of like weird limbo but mm -hmm. once you come back to a more standard rate of you know existence like we are then your body will have aged at a much slower rate than everything but it's around not your you. biological processes it's time itself in your existence your body remains exactly the same and you feel that you're experiencing time normally yeah. but when you come back it's the twin paradox you come back less time as elapsed but it has nothing to do with the actual physicality. It's the time itself for the traveling astronaut is shorter, is shorter. So yeah, and that's the sort of typical travel in the future because you come back and you're this Aiden has aged 50 years, you've only aged a year, yeah. right? That's the idea. But mm -hmm. travel to the past is also possible. If the listener is talking about like real-time travel, travel to the past is possible just not through special relativity, through other methods. So interesting. Another program. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, we, it seems like we have a lot of time to travel. We uh, <laughs> have you on like once a month at this point. Yeah, right. Uh, Norberto Rodriguez Jr. is back again for $2 saying, I ask these questions because I lucid dream a lot. Oh. Ah, there you go. I don't know. Do there it. you go. Uh, party like 1776 for $11.76. Love it. Says, uh, to hell with Taylor. Detroit will bring Slim Shady to the Super Bowl. Also, it's 2024 and still January. This year is going to be even crazier than last. Cue welcome to another election year. Blank. Oh, right. <laughs> it is an election year. Yeah. Can't wait for the commercials, huh? Oh, it's... I'm just looking forward to the debates. But more importantly, the drinking games during the I was going to say that in the popcorn <laughs> and everything, yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, we, we, we're we living in Oh, Miss Harry said simulation of the past. So, yes. A yes. simulation yeah, yeah. of the past. Okay, right. yeah. Well, yeah. that is thankfully the last one. Yes. And I don't say thankfully because I don't enjoy doing this show. I say thankfully because I slept four hours last night. Uh, <laughs> boy, put in a lot of work for today's filming. Yeah, I was, I was researching yeah. until 2 a.m. and then couldn't fall asleep because I drank so much coffee to stay awake until 2 a.m., um but yes so i uh, you know benjamin thank you so much for for coming on tonight do you want to tell everybody about uh the title of your book and you know why why they should buy it you don't have to buy it but try to buy it uh why should you buy it because i have college tuition to pay that's why you should buy it um so the book is called <laughs> deciphering reality and uh you should look it up and there are excerpts actually you can read for free online i believe and as I say, the, the thing that uh, I, I like about the book is that it's not written in a lot of academic jargon. And it talks about art, it talks about Taoism, it talks about physics, it talks about philosophy. So it's a very fun combination of things because I like writing books that I myself would want to read. And I had to read a lot of academic books as I was going through school. And this is kind of a break from that. So check it out. And uh, hopefully we'll talk about this stuff again. And uh, if you send questions to our hosts subsequent to the show, happy to answer them. Yeah, I can always, uh, I can always feed them along if, uh, if they come Absolutely. up. I did, I did see one in there, which uh, obviously you being, you being a, a professor, you might have a, an answer to that might be different than mine. But I'm curious, uh, who said, hey, Aiden, as a historian, are you able to write papers on Native American history slash folklore, or is that a no-no since it isn't your area of study? Which I'm, I'm curious, you as having worked in the field, and and we can uh, end just after this, but this is kind of more for my interest than anything else, and also to answer the question. But have you totally ever like written yeah. written something outside of your direct area of study and been nailed for it's it? My life, it's my yeah. whole life. Uh, so I'll answer that question. Before I answer, just I want to thank you guys both, oh, absolutely. And again, make sure you get a screenshot for our alma yeah. mater. <laughs> oh, the whole After thing I mean schedule. is recorded, That's so you can go through and pick your favorite one. Yeah. Okay. But I want to thank you guys very much of to course. the audience. This has been you guys fun. are great hosts. Um, so it's very interesting. And actually, I brought this up in another podcast I did. So I have a weird career in that I studied one thing, but ended up writing in many different things. So mm -hmm. I've written about Taoism. I've written about art. I've been interviewed on design. All mm -hmm. this always outside my field. So I'll try to make the story brief. But um the other book that Aiden interviewed me about was called Lost Knowledge. This is about archaeology, ancient mm -hmm. history. And in writing that book, I had to deal with stuff that was way outside my typical training of like history and philosophy. So, for example, I translated these Chinese texts that talked about flying machines, all that mm -hmm. kind of weird stuff. And I was very nervous that, what did you say? I was nervous that somebody would nail me on this. Yeah. So I actually sent the material 
to someone else I know, a famous professor actually at Penn. And I wrote to him, I said, Nathan, you know, is this stuff cut it? Like, is this up to standard? Because I don't want to be, if I can mention his name, like Graham Hancock, mm -hmm. or I'm just spinning stuff. I want to be a pro, right? And so he sends it back. He goes, this stuff, it's good. You know, you've done good translations, et cetera. Then the book is published. Mm -hmm. And I actually just recently got a review from a guy in China, at one of the top universities. He says, I love the book. This is really good. You deal with the Chinese text well and everything. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's friggin' amazing because I'm not a sinologist, mm -hmm. not a China expert. But if you're going to work outside your field, you work your damnedest and you yeah. want to buy an expert. And what I hate is people just trying to wing it. Like, so you should work out of your field. You should write on indigenous beliefs or Native American stuff, but read everything else mm -hmm. and make sure you're a pro. And it is a tough, tough job, but it's how you should yeah. do it. Like I, I, I always tell people, I play soccer. I never played soccer in high school. I go out there and I play with guys who are really good. I watch them. I learn from them so that I can play uh, sort of close to their standard, but it's hard and you got to, you know, force yourself. Don't yeah. get lazy. There's a lot of lazy work out there. Yeah. A lot of lazy work. So that's that's very similar to my opinion on it. Is I I studied history. History is a methodology. I studied specifically one kind. That doesn't mean I can't take the skills I learned and apply right. it somewhere else. Because Absolutely. at the end of the day, it's if you're a historicist, you're doing historicism no matter what kind of history you're doing, what you're studying, you're still looking at it through the same lens. So same methods. Yeah. yeah. Um just, also be rigorous there's one little uh hipper for two dollars says for the discord fights with the catholics oh boy i'm scared to check the discord after <laughs> this episode well benjamin thank you so so much and please tell everybody at the lodge i am sorry <laughs> i will be there in february um be there in march Come i will be there call. in march too but i will be there in yeah. february uh All for right. for both cool. the uh the you know the the actual stated meeting and the fun let's sit around and talk about the yeah the chat the outside okay. of there the out the out of the box stuff meetings so Absolutely. i'm excited about those actually i can't wait yeah. but um and thank you so much thank you guys both other aiden you wanted to send me a question email me uh aiden mattis has my email so by all means Perfect. email me and then also write something up to send to the episcopal magazine yeah that'd um, be great yeah we that'd can be fun for you guys it. that'd be cool uh, uh, thank you guys again right. very much. I really appreciate that. So Absolutely. appreciate thank you having you. me on. So thank you, Benjamin. Cool. All right. Peace. Peace. Bye, everybody.